you cannot play any games about this. You have to admit that this is wrong. I think especially for mathematicians to come in and see an environment where there's guiding ideas that people haven't really worked out and a lot of things are known do not work for known reasons, but people are still acting as if this is not true and trying to figure out how to do something and make career for themselves. Peter Woit is a theoretical physicist and a mathematician at Columbia University. He's been an influential figure in the ongoing debates surrounding string theory. His critiques, as articulated in his book, Not Even Wrong, strike at the heart of many popular assertions about this framework. Professor Woit also has a widely read blog in the math and physics scene called Not Even Wrong, so it's the same name. And the links to all resources, everything mentioned will be in the description as usual. We take meticulous timestamps and we take meticulous show notes. In one sense, the problem with string theory is the opposite of the problem of fossil fuels. With fossil fuel companies, you have a goal, let's say it's to wash your clothes, and you're able to achieve that goal, but you produce negative externalities. Whereas string theory has plenty of positive externalities, but arguably achieves little toward its initial goal. Professor White introduces a novel toe approach called Euclidean twister unification. You may recognize that term twister as it's primarily associated with Roger Penrose. Twisters provide an alternative to space-time descriptions in quantum physics. Peter's application of twisters is in the Euclidean setting, and he talks about how this significantly changes the playing field. It opens up a connection between gravity and the weak interaction because space-time in this formulation is inherently chiral. We also talk about spinners and Michael Atiyah. You know how some people are Christian mystics or Muslim mystics? Well, Atiyah seems to be a spinner mystic. We alternate between technical and more intuitive discourse. If you're new to the Theories of Everything channel, this is par for the course, and my name is Kurt Jaimungal. Usually what we do is we interweave between rigorous, steep technicality, and then periods of explaining the intuition behind what was just said. In other words, you can think of it as high-intensity interval training for the mind. Recall the system here on Toe, which is if you have a question for any of the guests, whether this guest or from a different Toe podcast, you can leave a comment on that podcast with the word query and a colon. This way, when I'm searching for the next part with this guest, I can press Control F, easily finding it in the YouTube studio backend. Further, if I'm able to pose your query, I'll cite your name verbally, either aloud or in the description. Welcome and enjoy this episode with Peter White. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you. I've been wanting to speak to you for almost two years since you came out with Euclidean Twister Theory or Euclidean Unification Theory. And well, here you are. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's uh... I'm anyway I'm looking forward to the opportunity to kind of be, to be able to talk about some of these topics, and uh, I've certainly enjoyed some of your other programs, and uh, the, the one with um, my friend uh, Edward Frankel recently was was really spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, that's all due to Ed, of course. <laughs> okay, what are you working on these days? What's your research interest? Yeah, so so there's something very specific. I'm just in, in the middle of trying to finish a short paper about an idea. Which um, not quite sure what what, what the oh, I guess I guess I've for now entitled the, uh, the the draft of the paper is titled space time is right handed, and uh, <laughs> there's a slight danger I'll change conventions uh, it'll end up being that slight space time is left handed but I think it will stay right handed and uh, mm. and that that's um it's related to the twister stuff that I've been working on for the last few years which I um I'm still quite excited about but but there was always there's something at the there's one kind of basic claim at, at the bottom of, of, of what I'm trying to do with the twisters, which is, um, I think, to the standard way of thinking about particle physics in general, relativity and spinners, it's uh, it's it, yeah, it, it's initially not very plausible. I should say one reason that I actually didn't. Um, it took me a long time to get back to the Euclidean twister stuff from some early ideas years ago. Was that I, I didn't actually believe that the this this basic thing. That I needed to happen could happen, and um, and I think lots of other people have had the same the same problem with this. And the more I looked in, into the twister stuff, the more I became convinced that you know this something like this had to work out. But uh, more recently, the last few months, I've come up with um, you know an understanding in, in much simpler terms, not involving twisters, just involving spinners about um, about the really unusual thing that's going on here. And I, I think that you know I've I've been trying to write up kind of a an explanation of of, of the basic idea, and, and I think it, it's a fairly simple one. And uh, as I've been writing it up, I keep thinking, well, wait a minute, can this really work? There's no way this can actually really work. And but the more I've been thinking about it, the more I've been convinced, yes, this actually does really work. So I'm hoping within the next few days to have a 
a final version of that paper. Well, not a final version, but a version of that paper I can at least send around to people and um, uh, try to get comments on and also write about it and publicly on my blog. I read the paper. Thank you for okay, sending yeah, it. I, I sent you. Yeah, what you have is a very, it was a very early draft of it, which made even less, hopefully the, I'll have something that will make more sense will be what all the public will see, but we'll see. Yeah. Do you think spinners are more simplified or easy to understand than twisters? Oh yeah, yeah. So 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 spinners are a really very basic, very very basic things. I mean, every you know every elementary particle like el- electrons are just dis- the way you describe them. Their spin would have nature is as spinners. You have to electron wave functions are spinners, and so so they're in every you know every physics textbook or every if you do quantum mechanics or you do quantum field theory, you have to spend a fair amount of time in spinners. So. Spinners are very, very basic things, and they're not. Um, I spent a lot of my career kind of thinking about them, trying to better understand them, and I keep learning new things. And it, it's in the last few months I kind of went. I realized something about them, which, um, yeah, it, which I think, which I think is new. At least I'd never seen before. And this is mm-hmm. what I'm trying to write, to write about. But they're they really are, they're very fundamental objects. It's a little bit hard to. Anyway, okay, I can give you a whole lecture on spinners. I'm not sure what, how much of that you want or where you want to start with that. Right. Well, there's one view that we can understand them in quotes algebraically, but that doesn't mean we understand what spinners are. So that's the Michael Atia approach where he says it's like the letter I, the complex I, the imaginary I back in the 1400s or 1500s. It's only now or a couple hundred years later, you realize what they are. And so sure, we have many different ways of describing spinners mathematically, but it's still a mystery as to what they are. So do you feel like, no, we understand what they are, or there's much more to be understood more than the formalism? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Yeah, you bring up Atia. Yeah, so Atia at various points was, um, you know, did, did make this argument that there's something very interesting and in, which we don't understand going on with, with the spinners. And but yeah, he, he I think was thinking of it in in a much more general context. Spinners, you know, are really if you try and, and do geometry of any kind, um, or reminding a geometry, you re um expressing everything in terms of spinners and t- instead of in terms of vectors and tensors, uh gives you a very different um and in some ways more powerful formalism, but uh but one that people are not that used to. And 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 it has some amazing properties. It, it's kind of deeply related to um to notions about topology and K theory and the Dirac operator get, gets into it. And so the thing that made Atia, you know, really most famous, his his index there was Singer. You know, this is the the it's basically saying, you know, you can compute everything comes down to a, a certain kind of fundamental case, and that is the fundamental case of the Dirac operator and spinners. So he was seeing spinners kind of at the, you know, you know, as as this really kind of central thing to 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 the most important thing that he'd worked on, and so, so there's a lot to say. So there's a lot known about spinners, but there's also a lot. It's a little bit mysterious where they come from. Mm-hmm. I think the, the the new stuff that I've been more and so I've been thinking about that a lot over the years. But uh, but the new stuff that has gotten where I where I think there's something new that I, that I see going on is not the general story about spinners, but a very, very specific story about spinners in four dimensions. So for, so you, you have spinners in any dimension, any dimension you can write down spinners and, and they, they're useful. But in, in four dimensions, some very, very special things happen. And the other very, very special thing, that's interesting thing that's going on in four dimensions is that from the point of view of physics, there's two different um, signatures that you're interested in. You're interested in either spinners in the usual kind of four dimensions where all four dimensions are the same and you're you're just trying to do euclidean geometry in four dimensions which i might sometimes call euclidean spinners mm-hmm. or you're interested in spinners of the sort that you actually observe in uh, relativistic quantum field theories where the geometry is that of minkowski space so sometimes we refer to those as minkowski spinners and so you have two different versions of four dimensions one with a totally positive signature and one where one direction has the opposite sign than the others in the um in the metric so time you have to treat time differently than space and, and that's Minkowski space so there's two there are different things in the general story that i'm interested in here one is very specific what have specifically the geometry of four dimensions and the other is very specifically 
the relation between Euclidean and Minkowski signature spinners. So is it your understanding or your proposal that the world is actually Euclidean and it's been a mistake to do physics in a Minkowski way? When we wick rotate, we see that as some mathematical trick. And you're saying, no, 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 that's actually the real space. That's the <laughs> real, quote unquote, even though there's something imaginary about it. Yeah. And the Minkowski case was the mistake. Like an analogy would be, we operate in USD. And then for some calculations, it's easier to go into yen. And yeah. we think that the actual world is operating in the United States and the calculations are just something to make the numbers easier. Yeah. And then you're saying, no, 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 what's really happening is in Japan and it's been a mistake to go into the USD or the USD is just to make the math easier. So is that what you're saying or no? Well, so so, so this goes back more to the, um, the Euclidean twister stuff. Yeah, so, so, so there, well, yeah, it's it's been well known in physics that you really kind of, that you, the problem with, there's a problem with Minkowski space time. If you try and write down your theory of Minkowski space time, you um, the, the simplest story about how a free particle evolves, you write down you know the formulas for what's a free particle going to do, what's its propagator, and you see that it, it's just ill defined. There is no you know you you've written down a formula which you know, math mathematically is ill defined. It needs more information in, in order to actually be a well defined formula. And um, I mean, technically, if you look at any physics book, you'll see they're saying, well, you know, we're going to do the answer is this integral. And you look at this integral, and this integral is going straight through two poles, poles. And, uh, you know, th that's just ambiguous. You don't know what, how to define such a, there are ambiguities about how you define such integrals. So the one the aspect what you've always known you have to do something like with rotation you have to do something you have to ex get rid of those ambiguities and one way of getting rid of those ambiguities is you know analytically continuing and making time a complex variable analytically continuing it analytically continuing maybe to Euclidean signature and there the formulas are well defined so it's um yeah I'm not sure <laughs> I'm very comfortable saying one of these is real and one of these is not mm. it's it's it, it's the same um it, it's the same formula it's just you have to realize that to make sense of it you have to kind of go into the complex plane in time and you can um if you things are analytic if this is a holomorphic function in time you can you you, you can you, you can either evaluate what happens at imaginary time or you can make make time real but you have to take the limit in a certain way um mo moving like perhaps starting with imaginary time and then moving um, analytically continuing a certain direction to get a uh, uh, real time. But th th that's, that's a standard story. That That's not me saying this, that's a standard story. But, right. and then there, you know, there's a, how do you, what sense do you make of this? Is this just a mathematical trick, which a lot of physicists will say, well, that's just some kind of weird mathematical trick. It's not, has nothing to do with reality. Or do you take this more seriously? Um, so what's always fascinated me is is more is that it's 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 fairly clear what's going on if you just talk about scalar fields if you talk about particles with spin zero or fields that transform trivially under rotations you know what happens when you um, go to go to imaginary time is you know is is quite interesting and in some ways tricky but it's um is very well understood but it, it's never actually been very well understood what happens. When you have spinner fields, and this is the the problem, is that these spinners in Euclidean signature and spinners in Minkowski signature are quite different things, and so you can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to analytically continue from one to the other," because you're it's they're, they're not they're not related. Anyway, it, 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 it's very unclear how you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so there's also a, a similar story in twister theory. You can um you can do twister theory in Minkowski space time, which is what Penrose and his um collaborators mostly did or you can do it in euclidean signature space time which is what atia and uh, a lot of other people mm -hmm. and mathematicians have done and and so, and in principle the two are related by analytic continuation but the way that works is quite um you know i, I think it's much it's much subtler than you expect and uh, and so and what i've been interested in you know it, it, most recently this this business about um it really is is a claim that the standard way of thinking about how you analytically continue between these two different kinds of spinners is um, you're making kind of a wrong, cho a wrong choice when you do that. And there's a, 
there's a good reason for the standard choice you're making when you normally when you do that but there is actually another choice you can make which is that um you know that, that in, instead of working with spinners which are kind of symmetric between there's two and there's two different kinds which by convention you can call right and left-handed or positive and negative chirality and the standard um setup treats this question um you know symmetrically but between the plus and minus the chirality is between right and left spinners but it's um what i've kind of realized recently is it, it looks like it's quite possible to to make this setup um you know completely asymmetric so that this so that you you just describe spinners using right these right-handed or positive chirality spinners you just don't use the left-handed ones at all in, in your construction of space time you can do that it, it, it appears to be and that's that's why i'm this paper is called space time is right-handed and yeah is it the case that you could have called it space time is chiral and you could have equivalently described as left-handed or is there something specific about right-handedness no yeah 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 it, it's certainly it, it's a matter of convention which um but you basically i mean in, to, to say it a little bit more technically you know there the um the 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 Lorentz symmetry group is is this group called SL2C. It's two by two complex matrices, a determinant one. Um, and what you realize is when you if you work if you come if you work in complex version of four dimensions, the symmetry group is um is two copies of SL2C, and you can call it a plus copy and a minus copy, or you can call it a right copy and a left copy. But but there's two of them. And the, the the standard convention in order to get analytic continuation to work out the way people expected has been to make to say that the physical Lorentz group that we that corresponds to our real world is is not chirally symmetric. It, it's it, it's kind of a diagonal, which is you, you use both the right and left, and you have to complex conjugate when you go from one side to the other. But it it, it kind of the Lorentz, the Lorentz group, the SL2C Lorentz group we know is supposed to sit as kind of a diagonal thing, which is both right, right, and left. But mm -hmm. um, what I'm kind of arguing is that no, you can actually set things up so that the um, the the Lorentz group is just one of these two factors. You can call it. It could have been the right factor, left factor. You have to make your a choice of convention. But but it, so it is very much a a chiral setup. Um, but you only. The, the strange thing about this is you only really see this when you complexify. If you just look at Minkowski space time, you know you don't you don't actually you don't actually see this this the, anyway you don't see this problem or, or you don't see this ability to make this distinction. It's only when you go to Euclidean space time where the the rotation group really does split into two completely distinct right and left things. Mm -hmm. Or if you go to complexified. Um, space time where you have this two copies of sl2c it's only in those contexts that you actually see that um, there is, there is a difference between choosing the diagonal and choosing the right-handed side so for sl2c you call that the lorentz group is that technically the double cover of the lorentz group yeah people use use both terminology if you're, if you're going to work with spinners you, you have to use a double cover but but yes it's also um yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you might want you, you might want to say that SO three one is the Lorentz group, and this is the spin, the double cover. But well, but mostly mostly you're working with you're interested in doing working with spinners, and then you you have to use the double cover, really. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes. So, is there a reason that triple covers or quadruple covers aren't talked about much? Is um, it just because of experiment? There's nothing there. Well, it, it's more the mathematics that they don't. Um, there is, I mean, there is, you know, any the rotation groups of any kind, you know, ten, have this to have this twofold nature. There is this spin double cut. There is this. They have these spin double covers. Um, and in many cases, you can cut one. One way of seeing this is just a basic topology. The topology of rotations has a, you know, ha, has a plus and minus thing in it, which you 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 kind of, and you have to do something about that. So so there aren't um. There aren't any kind of known uh inter interesting mathematically interesting uh mm. tri triple covers etc now in the standard model the way that it's written in bundle language is that it's a principal bundle and then the gauge groups are the structure groups and then for general relativity you have a tangent bundle and then some people say that the gauge group of gr is the diffeomorphism group 
But is there a way of making that into a bundle, like a principal bundle with the diffeomorphism group? How is one supposed to understand yeah. that as a bundle construction? That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, a- anyway, there, there's a lot of different ways. There's several different ways of thinking about geometry and about um, Ramanian geometry. And yeah, and this starts to get a, a complicated subject. The so, but maybe maybe the best way to well thinking in terms of diffeomorphism groups is, is something you can do. I, it's actually not my favorite way of doing this kind of geometry, and for for the reason is that it um well, maybe let, let me just say something about about an, an alternate way of uh, of thinking about geometry, which which seems to me more powerful. Maybe actually to motivate this a little bit better, sure. If if you just think about diffeomorphism groups, it's very very hard to understand what what spinners are and where they come from. You really kind of can't see them at all in if you're just thinking about um, the diffeomorphism group of a manifold. So the 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 uh, there's a, the other formulation of geometry going back to Cartan, which is um, which makes it much makes it much easy to see where spinners are going on going and is a lot more powerful in other respects. Is to uh, to think not about your not about a manifold, but 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 about the a bigger space, which which is a bundle that, for each point in the manifold, you look at you, you consider all possible um, bases for the tangent bundle, it's also called frames. And so this is sometimes called the frame bundle. And so it's kind of saying if you want to understand geometry, you, you should look at the points of space and time. But at the same point, you also got to think about the tangent space, and you should and you should think about the um, the possible bases of the tangent space and the, the so-called frames. So you should always kind of think, instead of writing all, all your formulas to, in terms of local coordinates on the on the manifold, you should think think about your problem as being a problem that lives up on the frame bundle, and that you always you're not just you're not just at yeah. a point in space time, but you but you've also got a frame. And then, but then you have to be careful to kind of work kind of equivariantly that you have you you know you can. Ch- you can change your choice of frame. You can rotate your frames. So you have you kind of work up in the frame bundle, but equivalently with respect to rotations or whatever. That so that's uh that gives a lot more structure to the problem. In particular, it allows you to easily say what spinners are, which um you couldn't if you just talked about it. So um mm-hmm. so a- a- anyway, there's there's a lot more one could say about diffeomorphism groups and and that, but 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 just in terms of the the relation to the spinner stuff, maybe it's yeah, best to to forget about it to 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 to, 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 to say it that way. It's it's not yeah it, that that you're gonna you have to do something quite different if you're going to talk about spinner. Right. Okay. Now the problem you were working on earlier that you said you weren't sure if it would have a solution, and you're finding that it does. What was it in the early part of the conversation? What you were working on your research interests? Well. Oh, oh, do you mean uh, right at the beginning, where I'm still where the, what I'm what I'm still confused about? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it seemed to me that you were saying you're solving the problem. Oh, this. Yeah. So, so, so you this didn't was, think it could be solved. You're surprised. Yeah. By yeah. It. So, so this actually, I mean, this was actually it goes back to when I was graduate student or postdoc. And this first occurred to me. Look, you know, actually, I mean, maybe to kind of explain how this all came about. So I was a graduate student at Princeton, and. Um, I was working on lattice gauge theory, so we're working on th- this kind of formulation of Yang Yang Mills theory in a, on a, on a lattice, and so you could actually do computer calculations of it. And so, I had, and I was trying to understand, you know, there's a lot of interest in topological effects in Yang Mills theory, and I was trying to understand how to study those in the kind of numerical calculations on a lattice. And and then, so I, I made some progress on that, but then. Um, and the next thing that really occurred to me was exactly spinners came up. It's like, besides having Yang Mills theory on the lattice, we also want to put spinner fields on the lattice. So there's this really beautiful way of putting um, gauge fields on the lattice in Yang Mills theory, which kind of respects the geometric nature of the gauge fields very, very nicely. It's kind of the Wilson's lattice gauge theory. But the but there isn't if you try and put spinners in the lattice, a lot of very mysterious things happen. And and again. In some sense, the problem is that if you're just looking at this lattice that you, you you've written down, it, it, it mm-hmm. it's clear kind of what vector you know what the discrete analogs of vectors are and of 
of planes and of you know mm-hmm. of, of of those things but it's very very unclear what the you know since you don't really have a, a good way of thinking about spinners in terms of kind of standard geometry of you know lines planes etc you don't really know how to put the spinners on the lattice in a way that respects their geometry and 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 if you try to write down the formulas or do anything you, you run into a, a lot of weird problems there's a lot of Anyway, there's a long story about what happens if you yeah. put spinners in the lattice. And, is this related to doubling, like the species doubling? Yeah. So there's one. Yeah. So so one thing you find is that you really you can't. There's no kind of con- consistent way to put <clears throat> kind of a, a single kind of fermion in the lattice. That if you try and do it any way you know of doing it, kind of produces all these kind of extra versions of the same thing, and you have to somehow disentangle those. <clears throat> That's part of part of the problem. Okay. But that's when I started thinking about the geometry of spinners and, and some ideas about putting them on the lattice. And, and and then what I was seeing, I started to see that, wait a minute, you know, if you, so this is all happening in Euclidean space where the, where the rotation group has, is a copy of two, two SU2s. There, there's, again, a left-handed one and a right-handed one, if you like. And um, what I was seeing really was that the, the some of the choices, I, the geometry I was trying to use to put these things in the lattice gave me kind of th- things occurring in kind of multiplets that 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 look that had the same su2 structure as what you see in a, in a generation of electroweak particles so in a generation of electroweak um electroweak particles that you, you for instance have neutri- you have a neutri- you have a neutrino and left-handed neutrinos and you have right-handed left-handed electrons for instance and those have certain transformation properties under the SU2 and under a U1. And, and those were, were the same ones that I was seeing when I was trying to construct these spinners. So so I so I had the so it seemed to me, you know, if you can think of part of this rotation group, this SU2, as an internal symmetry, as the as the symmetry of the um, of the weak interactions uh, of the Weinberg Salah model, then you know you could actually anyway you, you you got all sorts of interesting things to happen but but the thing that this but making this idea work really required that some explanation of why in euclidean space what you thought were space-time symmetries that really broke up into half space-time symmetries and half an internal internal symmetries which didn't affect space-time so i i never um mm-hmm this is what for for many years after looking at this I was like wait well this just can't work I mean you can't if you just look at the whole formalism for how you've set this up and you know you both of these SU2s have to be space time symmetries you can't they're both going to affect space time you can't you can't get away from that other people didn't see this as a problem no no I, I think everybody saw this as a problem I mean I think a, a, anybody who ever looked at this idea of of trying to get you know one of the part of the four-dimensional rotation symmetry to be an internal symmetry has probably backed uh-huh. away backed away from it for the same reason saying well wait a minute this can't you know the, i just can't see how that could actually happen that, that you have to <laughs> you're telling me this should be an internal symmetry which doesn't affect space time but it looks to me that <laughs> you're rotating space time with it so you can't do that and so, so this so this is what um for many years kind of kept me f- from going back to that from to, to those ideas and as I learned more about quantum field theory, actually, one motivation as I was teaching this course on <clears throat> quantum field theory and quantum field theory in the back of my mind is, okay, you know, as I go along and teach this course, I may not explain this to the students, but I'm going to very, very carefully look at the at the formalism and, and, and I'm going to understand exactly how this analytic continuation is working of these spinners. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm going to, um, you know, commit, and I'm going to see that, you know, it looks like this has to work and I'll, I'll finally understand why. And then I can stop thinking about this. But, but, I, but I kind of, as I was teaching this, as, as, as I was looking at this, I, I kind of never actually saw, you know, anyway, I, it, 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 I never actually really saw the art, the argument for why this, why this has to be a space time symmetry. It, it looked like it had to, but you couldn't quite pin down why. And uh, anyway, so, so, so then, when I went back to the twister stuff, I, I, I became convinced that the um, if you think about everything in terms of twisters, then the whole twister setup is, is naturally chirally asymmetric. So you um, you kind of, from the twister point of view, 
this kind of thing lo- looked a lot more um a lot more plausible and i got more interested in it in it again but it but it, it, it's only very recently the last few weeks the last couple of months that i've kind of i kind of ha- have a very good understanding of it, exactly why it seemed that you know that what i what i that that why i was right that this should be impossible there is a standard assumption that you're making which which makes what i wanted to do impossible but it, it's also possible to not make that assumption and do something else and that assumption is and it, 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 it's the symmetry between right and left it's kind of when you um when you go between minkowski and euclidean spinners you know do, the the setup that you use to analytically continue do you do that in a setup which is um which is right left symmetric and 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 if you want the setup to be holomorphic then you have to you have to use the right left symmetric one but what i so so simultaneously i realized yes you can yeah yes i mean in the standards there was a very very good reason that i and everyone was skeptical that this could make sense but there also there there actually is 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 a way around it and uh, you can just uh Decide. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna just use right-handed spinners, and I'm and I'm and I'm gonna, and and you can get mm-hmm. uh you you can get a theory that makes sense. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but I recall in one of the lectures that I saw online of you, and you were giving the lecture. I believe Cole Fury was in the audience. You were saying that what we have to use are hyperfunctions. Yeah. Am I jumping ahead because you're saying no, no, it's not going to be holomorphic? No, I mean that. No, but but actually, hyperfunctions are really part of the holomorphic story. They're they're um yeah they're not they're uh, I mean hyperfunctions are, are really just saying so, so. What I was saying when I was trying to explain this business about you know why about wick rotation and that and that things were um that if you write down the standard formulas, you end up with something in in Minkowski space time which is ill-defined. Okay, and and then you have to use you have to define it by, via Rick rotation or, or analytic continuation. There, there, there's just a, another way of of saying that more, with putting it in a more interesting mathematical context is to say that the things that you're looking at in Minkowski space time are not actually normal functions. They're or do, they really are what about they are they are best thought of as hyperfunctions, and in this case, they're hyperfunctions which are just um analytic which are just kind of bound boundary values of analytic things as you uh, a, approach uh, approach the real line but um yes yeah, so, so the hyperfunction story is, is just kind of part of the standard it's really part of the wig rotation story yeah mm, okay yeah but what i'm i mean this latest thing i'm trying to do actually gets away from analytic continuation you're not um you really i'm really it's what's kind of i'm, I'm still kind of you know, try, trying to wrap my head around exactly what the implications of this are, but 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 you are, you're you're not doing the standard sort of analytic continuation anymore. The the, the, mm-hmm. the standard sort of way of analytically continuing, which uses all all four space time dimensions, that you're not you're not doing that. You're you're doing something some something different, and uh, it, it it's unclear. Yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, I mean. I, if you start writing out formulas, you'll still get the same story with hyperfunctions. But um, what prompted you to then go look at twisters? And by the way, is it called a twister formalism or a twister formulation? I don't know. I think either one is. I don't know if those are used interchangeably. Because yeah, I, I hear, for yeah. instance, that there's different quantum formalisms like Wigner's or interaction or path or categorical. But then sometimes I hear, yeah, the categorical formulation of quantum mechanics. And I'm like, okay, you get the idea. Well, well, they're not. I mean, the thing about twisters is, is they're not actually. Um, I mean, maybe a good thing to say about twisters is we don't actually know exactly what their relevance is to the real world. So you might, if you had a, if you had a well, when you if you have a well developed idea using twisters for describing the the real world, and you wanted to contrast it to other similar descriptions, you you, you might want to say, oh, this is the twister formalism, or maybe twister formulation. I don't know. Uh-huh, but, it, uh-huh. but, it, but it, it's a little bit but either one is a little bit um premature in terms of physics that we don't actually know what um exactly how the twisters are related to the, to the real world so it's not like you can translate a real world problem to twister formalism and then back well you can so 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 twist maybe so twist twisters are a bit like spinners but the um 
So they have some of the mathematical properties of spinners, but but they're, they they do something more interesting. They're kind of a higher dimensional thing. Maybe one of the best things to say about them is that they're um, they're very useful if you want if you so if you want to understand Minkowski space time, you know you this is what Einstein figured out. You can you can use um, Minkowski's geometry, Minkowski metric. If you want to talk about just vectors and metrics and tensors, or if you, you talk about Minkowski space type spinners, if you want, and that's what I've been most interested in. But the other interesting thing about our theory is when we write them down in, in Minkowski space time, um, theories of like mass of massless fields and uh, things like Yang Mills theory, they're they have this bigger invariance group than just the under rotations and translations. They're conformally invariant. So uh -huh. the, 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 the geometry of crystals really comes into its own. If you're trying to describe, to understand the properties of the, um, of space time under, under, under conformal transformations. And, uh, anyway, so, so that, that's, kind, that's kind of a motivation. So if you don't care about conformal transformations you may not be very interested in spinners but mm. if you really want to understand you know what is how do i write down my theories and how do how do i have a version of you of Minkowski space time that um where the conformal group acts in in, in a nice linear fashion and where, where everything works out and and the the, sp the spinner you, know, you can call it a, now you can call it a formalism or a formulation but it, it's a way of doing conformal geometry it really comes into its own so that's so so spinners you know go i mean twisters go way way back and and you know this really was mainly um roger penrose is doing in the in the 60s and you know and and he was very interested in using them to to understand uh uh you know things ha things happening in minkowski space time and especially the conformal invariance of these things and so there, there's a huge amount of effort and uh a lot of beautiful things discovered during the 70s especially by uh him and his collaborators in minkowski space time and then atia realized that you could take take this over and do some very very interesting things in Ramanian geometry and euclidean space time yeah so i mean i i was you know i, I kind of learned about this geometry at the raise points that sentence could be yeah. said about atia in the most general form and yeah. then atia realized you could use this for underscore with geometry yeah 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 yeah. So it's, uh, but, but, but anyway, so, so I, I've been kind of aware about twisters for a long time, but I, you know, I, I didn't see, anyway, I, I actually wrote a, wrote a very speculative paper long, long, long ago about this. And, and, and it, it mentioned the connection to twisters, but it, um, but there's just a lot about them that you know, I didn't understand back then. It took me many years to understand. And especially the, um, the relationship between is, Euclidean signature and Minkowski signature spinners, how they're related is that, that that's that's quite a tricky story, which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. took me a long time to understand. So you had the splinter in your thumb for decades about the space-time symmetries and them acting not just on space-time. What happened in 2020 and 2021? Um I think now I'm trying to think what specific <laughs> one thing that happened in 2020 was COVID. So <laughs> right <laughs> in so your mind, like, what happened? Okay. Well, so, 2019 so I, then? No, 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 in 20, no. But this is actually relevant because because sure. actually in, in in 2020 I was much more um and I was, I was thinking of this stuff, but yeah, but yeah, but in 2020 all of a sudden you're kind of you know you're at home you're at home a lot that you're just sit, sitting there and uh, I office at home and I don't have a lot of all the usual distractions or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and so, and, and, and so that actually, um, I actually gave, gave me some of the more time to kind of think peacefully about, uh, about some of this stuff and make some, and make some progress. Yeah. So I'd have, I'd have to, I mean, I can remember now, but you know, it, it, exactly which things became clear at which times, but it's, it's been a slow, it was a slow process of various things clarifying, but, but I, I think maybe that was one of the main things is to finally get a picture in mind of how, how Euclidean and Minkowski um, twister theory all fit together. Yeah. Also, how does it fit? Is there a way <laughs> of explaining it? Well, I mean, maybe the best thing to say about twister theory is that it, it really, it really kind of naturally wants to be a theory of complex space time. It, and this is the thing: if, if you write, if you say, "I'm going to study four dimensional complex space time," and I want, I'm interested in its conformal group and things like that, then. 
the Twister story is actually very, very simple. It, it's very, I mean, it, you're basically just saying that uh, there's a four complex dimensional space and a point in space time is a, a complex two plane in that four dimensional space. So points, anyway, yeah. So, so you sh- instead of thinking of mm-hmm. the way of, of normal thinking of, a sp- of some space with these points, well, you got to think, think about, just think about the complex two planes and complex four dimensional space and and you know everything just kind of drops out of that and and there is one there, there's a beautiful relation of that story to the theory of spinners is that and this is kind of the relationship between the the, the um theory of spin, twister and theory of spinners in twister theory a point in four dimensional space space time is a complex two plane that by def that's the definition of what a, what what a point is and now that um but that complex two plane you know that that kind of tautologically answers the the, the question of where do these spinners come from because the, the space of spinners is a complex two plane well you know so from the standard point of view it's like you know as i was saying if you just think about the different morphism group it's very very hard to even say what a spinner is so where are these weird complex two planes coming from well from the point of view of twister theory it's purely tautological it's just you know the two plane is a point so so the the spinner the spin one half two plane complex two plane which is describing the spin of, of a of a um of an electron is exactly a, a point it, it, anyway that, that that's exactly what, what what the definition of a point is so you can't um a point in twister space or a point in space time spinning in space time yeah so it's twister space is a, a four complex dimensional thing and uh but but the points that and so the, the points in it correspond to various structures in space time but the the complex two planes in it correspond to the points in space time anyway that's one of the basic yeah so then is the statement that the points in space time are the same as spinners or the points in space time or the structure of space time gives rise to the structure of spinners and vice versa or are none of those statements correct I think yeah, and no, I I think both of them. I mean, it, it really is telling you. Twister theory is really telling you that it's a it's a way of thinking about space time in which. And sorry, this is four dimensional space time. Four dimensional space time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a way of thinking about yeah. So twister theory is very very special to four dimensions. It doesn't really work in other dimensions. It um and it but it, it really is. It, it's a way of thinking about space time in which um, you know, the occurrence of spinners and their properties are just completely tautological. They're just built into the various definitions. Sociologically, why do you think it is that Penrose's Twister program, firstly, has been allowed to continue because many other <laughs> programs just die out if you're not loop or string or causal or asymptotic? Like, there's just four as far as I can tell. Five with Penrose. So why is it alive? And then why hasn't it caught on? Well, for, for I mean... Or maybe you disagree, it's not alive. No, no, no. It's, it's very much. It's very much alive. It's very much alive, and still. But and, and so there's an interesting kind of history. But but a lot of it was really Penrose. So he, you know, he he had this idea, and he's various places has explained, you know, how he came up with it, and he was very very struck by this, and and you know, so he quite successfully at, at Oxford built up a group of people working on this, and so you know, it, it was a kind of a you know a good example of kind of how it was how normal science kind of works sociologically. You know, somebody comes up with a good idea and they actually build a, a group of people around them. And people do, as, as people do more work, they learn more interesting things about this, more people get interested. So, you know, he always, you know, throughout the seventies, I would say and into the eighties, there always was a quite healthy group of people, um, you know, working on Penrose or people somehow having some relation to Penrose collaborators who were working on this. So it was, um, Anyways, but perfectly normal science. It, it wasn't. Um, it, it wasn't so clear though how, how to get. Um, it, it was clear. Some things were very clear. Some things were clear that this was really a beautiful way of writing down conformally invariant wave equations and studying their properties. So there were there were the, the beauty of the idea and, and the power to do certain things w- was known, but but it, it didn't seem to be necessary or to have any particular connection to specific problems in particle physics. So particle physicists would look at this and say, well, that's nice, but you know, I don't, that doesn't actually tell me anything. You know, mm. if I need, if I needed to do some conformally invariant calculations, I might be able to use that, but it's not actually telling me something really that, 
you know, really knew I can't get elsewhere. Um, and, and then, you know, in, and then in the eighties, you also had, a you know, Atia got into the game and there's a lot, a lot of mathematicians got, got into it through the, um, the relations to the, on the Euclidean side. So, you know, it, it was, a you know, especially among math, mathematicians, mathematical physicists, it was a fairly, it remained a very active area and it still is to this day, you know, a, a lot of it was based in, in, um, Oxford, but also a lot of other places. But yeah, I, I think the, but in, in terms of, of its, of its implications for physics, you know, I would say the thing that to me is, is, you know, I think Penrose kind of, and his people trying to connect this to physics in an interesting way, they, they kind of ran into, um, yeah. <laughs> And anyway, they kind of ran out of they kind of ran out of new ideas or some things that they could do, but they they couldn't actually get any kind of a really killer app, if you like. And uh, uh-huh. and 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 the big and it, and from my point of view, I mean, I don't know if I, I can. I, I think I, I, anyway, I don't know if they, what if I have, if I'll ever be able to convince them or what, what they think of it these days. But the the problem was that they were thinking of connecting this to physics purely from the Minkowski, on the, from the Minkowski space-time side. Mm. So they're looking at Minkowski space-time twisters, Minkowski space-time spinners. And those, the twister theory just didn't, if you just look at Minkowski space-time, you don't see, you, you, you don't see the sort of new things which, 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 which I'm, I'm finding interesting, which I think tell you something new about particle physics. You, you don't see this kind of internal the fact that one of these factors can be an internal symmetry you just can't can't see that in in Minkowski space time and then so and and, and then there there's some other more technical things about um I mean, better not get into that but but the there there's kind of a, <laughs> well it's okay the audience is generally extremely educated in physics and math yeah, I, I would actually uh, well maybe maybe to to, to 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 connect this to what I'm saying right is that I think you know the, also, the way people think about general relativity in, you know, Minkowski signature, general relativity is not a chiral theory. It's supposed to be left-right invariant, it's a parity symmetric theory. So, the problem with, with thinking about general relativity in terms of twisters is that your setup is completely chiral. So you 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 can you naturally end up end up with um, if you're trying to do gravity. With it, you end up with kind of a something that's not quite the right theory of gravity. It's kind of a chiral version of gravity. And uh-huh. anyway, this is a very interesting story. But but I, and I think um, Penrose always referred to this as the the googly problem. Right, the, right. Yeah, so, something I mean, about cricket. Yeah, and cricket. There's something about how the the, the, the ball. We're North and, American, so yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. Anyway, but but so for, if you know about cricket, you can definitely uh, maybe this makes more sense to you. But he always referred to this as a googly problem that he was kind of. In the twister theory, he's only getting one. He's only getting things spinning one way, and but but anyways, but you can see from from my point of view that that's that's evident that that was always that's evidence oh. of the, of exactly what I'm trying to say now that well space time is right handed. So, yes, yeah. So it, it's a related problem, but but that that was always kind of a so Penrose and and the people around him I think put a lot of effort into trying to revamp twister theory into something chirally symmetric. Now, why would they want to do that if the standard model isn't? Well, they, well, they weren't really. They weren't really trying to describe the standard model. They never really had. Uh, they, they really wanted to. They, they thought twisters were a way of thinking about space time, so they wanted to do general right. relativity. And general relativity is not a chiral theory. So they, um, yeah. So so they were trying to find kind of a how do we get rid of all this chirality, and uh, and they never were really successful at that. So you're saying it's a pro, not a con. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. It's a feature not a bug yeah yeah right right but in terms of one, one interesting fun thing about the sociology though is that what um you know so so the idea that you could get use twisters to to, to quantize to do general relativity and perhaps quantize it that was always something which you know penrose and his people were working on but um you know most physicists i think felt that, that wasn't really going anywhere this wasn't going to work and maybe Witten was probably one was an example of somebody i think who who really could see the mathematical power of these ideas and how important they were as as new ideas about geometry. Again, that's a general statement that can be said. And then Ed Witten saw the power of this yeah. mathematics, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Well, so, so he, I think even going back to a postdoc, he had learned about twisters. He was trying to do some things with it. But, um, but he never kind of, 
but he 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 then actually found, finally found something, and um, this was about twenty years ago, and what what became known as the twister string. So he actually became he he found a way of kind of writing, yeah, you know, a different way of writing down the um, perturbative calculations in Yang Mills in terms of um, of a sort of string theory, except it, it, it's a very different kind of string theory than. <clears throat> The one that the one that's supposed to be the theory of everything, and and it's a theory where the string lives in twister space. So Ritten wrote this really kind of beautiful, very very beautiful paper about twister string theory. And so and so since Witten is talking about twisters, of course, mm-hmm. all of a sudden there's a lot of physicists who were never had anything good to say about twisters, who all of a sudden are rushing out to learn about twisters. So so that, that and and there's but there's been an ongoing story of um of this twister string story, which is. A lot of people have done a lot of things, but it, again, a, a lot of it has has had hasn't really worked out the way people want. Like, and, and for the same reason as Pen that Pen has always had that the um, people who are trying to find quantize a chirally version, a chi- a chirally symmetric version of general relativity using this thing, and that's not what it really wants to do. So, um, and anyway, but 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 that that that's kind of that's sociologically very important about why most high energy physicists you know have more have heard about twisters and 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 don't and and often have nice things to say about them is because of the, the twister string mm. okay there are quite a few questions that i have okay one is the particle physicists repudiation of twister theory or just distancing from it because it's not useful to them is that something that they also slung at string theory or were they more embracing of it and wait, so who, I mean, I'm not quite sure who who do you kind of mean? Who do we are we talking about here? I'm not sure. Earlier, you said that the particle physicists weren't initially adopting string theory. Sorry, twister theory because it didn't provide them with anything that's new. You said, well, okay, if we need to do some conformally invariant calculation, we'll use twister theory. Yeah, but at the same time, string theory is known, or at least colloquially known, for not producing what's useful to high energy physicists, but useful outside of high energy physics, like to mathematics, or maybe yeah. condensed matter physics. But what I'm asking is, around the same time when they were distancing themselves from twister theory or not using it, were they then embracing of string theory, or they gave the same critique? Well, okay, so we have to. You should start if we're trying to talk about string theory. Yeah, that, that's a kind of a complex. This is kind of a complex story, and 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 it, it has the whole story of particle physics and string theory. That that's pretty well, pretty much completely disconnected from from twisters because. Um, I mean, the issues that 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 you know, people about why people were doing string theory or why they might might or might not want to do string theory or whatever, it really had nothing to do with twisters. The twisters is kind of a yeah. A, a, anyways, a speculative geometric framework framework, and then you know, and then twisters kind of make a a small kind of appearance due to Witten at at one point twenty years ago, but that's kind of about it. Um, yeah. So I mean, I I, I can. Maybe we 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 can start talking some about the, about the whole string theory and particle physics business, but I'm not twister anyway. Just twisters. It seems like a bad place to start. I'm not trying to mix up twisters with it. What I just meant to say was, it's interesting what gets accepted and what doesn't. Yeah. And so, why was string theory accepted? Take us through the history of that. Um, and also, okay. you could tell people who may have just heard the term, the name. Sorry, Ed Witten, but yeah. all they know about him is that he's a genius, but yeah. they don't realize that influence that he has. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 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 this this is a good place to start. Yeah. And 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 you know, Witten is really kind of central to this story. And so, you know, I, I think the the short summary of the history of of, of this subject of particle physics was that you know by 1973 you had this thing called the standard model, which uh, was this you know incredibly successful way of talking about particle physics and 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 capturing everything that you see when you um you know in these in when you do high energy physics experiments and 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 the story you know when i kind of came in at feels I, I went to start learning about probably started reading books and things about what's happening in particle physics probably right right around the mid you know, late 70s mid mid 70s I, I went to college in 75 and i spent most of my college career a lot of it learning about the standard model and and this stuff and then and um so by but but by the time by the time i left grad Grad school. So, I mean, by the time I left college, 1979, and I went to graduate school at Princeton, um, people were starting to get 
people had had spent had now spent you know six, let's say just six years let's say trying to figure out how to do better than the standard model and one mm-hmm. one thing is how to do find some kind of new anyway how to do better than the standard model as a theory of particle physics but also but one thing is the standard model doesn't give you a quantum theory of gravity so the other thing was how do we get a quantum theory of gravity so these were kind of the big problems are already in the air and 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 Witten you know so, so Witten is, is is a genius and he, he you know he had been a um a grad student at Princeton he actually came to Harvard as a postdoc I think in 77 78 and and, and I, I met him when he was actually was a postdoc uh and you know and he quickly you know that was start, started you know do, doing some some really really amazing things I went to Princeton 79 a year or two later he actually you know, you know, you know, he he went directly from a postdoc at Harvard to becoming a full professor at 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 Princeton, becoming a professor at Princeton very quickly, and he was there. And so, the years I was in um, Princeton as a graduate student were from seventy nine to eighty four, and those were years. You know, you know, people I think were were getting more and more frustrated that there were you know there there are lots of ideas coming up, but but every idea that people kind of tried to do better than the standard model. Or maybe to quantize gravity, really didn't you know didn't quite work. I think there, there's a lot of and people were kind of cycling every six months through. There's some new idea you'd work on it for six months or a year, and people start to realize, well, this doesn't really mm. do what we want to do. Let's let's find something else. So there there were a lot of new ideas, but but nothing really working out. But so but but Witten, Witten then, you know he he had been interested. There there was this idea that was very unpopular. The very few people were working on of to try to quantize gravity and un- and unify it with the particle physics with through string theory, and so it was you know people like um, uh, John Schwartz and Michael Green w- were working on this, but it was a very very small group of people, and there wasn't much um, attention being paid to that. Uh, at the, but 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 you know w- Witten was was paying attention. To, I think one one thing to say about him is that besides being a very very smart, he's also somebody who can. Uh, you know, read other people's ideas or talk to them and and absorb new ideas very, very quickly. So, you know, he he was kind of also spending a lot of time looking around, trying to see, you know, what other ideas are either out there. And this was one that he got interested in. <clears throat> but but for various reasons, technical reasons, he thought, you know, this there's a technical reason, so-called anomaly calculations about why this is not going to work out. And what happened right in, in the fall of '84, I actually went to as a postdoc to uh, to Stony Brook, and the in the right right around that time, Green and Schwartz had done this calculation that showed that these anomalies canceled, except there are some specific case where these anomalies canceled, and so Witten then became very excited about the idea that that you know you could use in that specific case of of this so-called superstring theory. To um, anyway, yeah. So 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 Witten heard about this and he said, he said, okay, you know, the thing that had been that reason I had in my mind why super string theory couldn't work as a unified theory, <clears throat> and now it looks maybe like maybe you can get around that. So he kind of then started working full full time on trying to you know come up with models or, or understand super string models that you could use to do unification, and um and so throughout kind of I was now at Stony Brook. But I was kind of hearing reports of what's going on at Princeton, and throughout late '84, '85, '86, this was, um, you know, Witten and the people around him. This is what they were working on, Obora, and and and, the, and they were, you know, it, they they had a very specific picture in mind. It was that, you know, this the super string only is consistent in ten dimensions. You so you can get rid of four of them by the so-called Calabi-Yau compactification and. Hopefully, there's only a few of these Calabi Yaos, and one of those is, is going to describe the real world. And you know, we're all going to we're going to have this wonderful, beautiful uni- unified theory using this kind of six dimensional geometry of Calabi Yaos, and we're going to have it within the next year or two. And that was what the way they were thinking. And you know, a lot of the people, you know, friends and colleagues of mine, who you know were, were doing kind of the, the thing that you would often do is go down. And go, you know, when you were in Princeton, go talk to Witten and say, "Here's here's what I'm working on." You know, can you? What do you think about this? And I got several of them reported back to me. Yeah, you know, I went down to Princeton, I talked to Witten, and 
he said, well, you know, what you're working on, that's all very nice. He said, well, and good, but, you know, you really should be working on string theory because that's actually, you know, where all the action is. And, and that's really, and, you know, we're, we're almost going to have the theory of everything there and you kind of mm. get to work on string theory. So, you know, th this just had a huge effect. So, so like, and, um, and this was called the so-called first super string revolution. And, you know, uh, uh, there's kind of, there's a story over the next five or 10 years of, of how, you know, people were brought into this field and people, some people were always skeptical, but, um, you know, it, 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 it kind of gained more and more inf influence and became institutionalized during kind of the decade after that. And in some sense, the weird thing, the weird thing, the weird thing that's hard to understand string theory was why, you know, once it became clear, these ideas weren't really weren't working out. Why didn't, you know, this just fall by the way wayside and people go and do something else. But 40 years later, we're still, <laughs> it's still here. And so, so it's a very strange, it's a very strange story. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the main physics, physical problem, or even mathematical problem of string theory? Do you see it as, well, how do we search this landscape? Or how do we find the right manifold, the six dimensional Kähler manifold? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that was always the thing that bothered me about it from the beginning, and which which I think is is the fundamental problem. It, it's and it's a fundamental problem whenever you decide to do to use higher dimensional Romanian geometry. If you, I mean, this actually goes back to Einstein. Einstein and, and these Kaluza Klein models. You know, people have often said, okay, well, you know, we had this beautiful theory of four dimensional geometry and Einstein general relativity, and we had this this particle physics stuff going on, which seems to have some interesting geometry to it. So let's just, let's just add some dimensions and, and, and write down a theory in five or seven or 10 or whatever yeah. dimensions, and then do geometry there. And that's going to solve, and that's going to be the unified theory. So, I mean, this is the sort of thing Einstein was thinking about, but um, if you start thinking about this, the problem is you, you realize that, these kind of internal dimensions that the the geometry of particle physics and the geometry of special relativity are quite different. They're not, um, you know, they're these metric degrees of freedom in four dimensions. And and, and if you try and you don't really have those in 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 um in in, in, in like in the standard model, it just doesn't have things like that. So and if you put those sort of dynamical variables into there, the ability for these for these other dimensions by the mm -hmm. four one to move all the, you, you you have a vast you you hugely increase the number of degrees of freedom and you, you have a, th a theory where, where you, you have to now explain why all this extra geometry which you've put in there and and, and which you're only trying to get a, a a kind of small kind of very rigid kind of couple pieces of information out why is are all these infinite number of degrees of freedom why how, how can you just ignore them? How, how can you, you have to find a dynamics, a consistent dynamics for them. And then you, and that consistent dynamics has to explain why you don't see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so that's always been the problem with like Kaluza Klein models and with any kind of extra dimensional models. And, and string theory just kind of has this problem in spades in, in your, um, you know, your, instead of feel, instead of point particles, you have strings, they have a huge number of new degrees of freedom. You have to, say that, well, the string vibrations are all happening at such high energies we can't see them. And then the extra 60, then they're trying to use the fact that super strings have very special properties in 10 dimensions. They um, And they're trying to use that to argue that our strings are moving in 10 dimensions and that four are the ones we see and six, six are going to be described particle physics. And so anyways, it, it, it becomes a very complicated theory you have to write down in order to kind of make any of this work and make any of this look look like physics. And the um, if, from the beginning, there there was kind of no story about why is anything that looks like the real world going to drop out of this, you know, and and and, and you know why that, and 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 that's still the case um, for forty years later and. Uh, uh, and the th the whole thing just suffers from this problem that you don't you don't actually you don't actually have the theory. There's kind of a when you say that you have a string theory and people say, oh, we have this mathematically elegant, well-defined, unique theory. They're talking about 
that's not a full theory that that that's that's a perturbative limit of, of a theory and so what they really need in order to answer the questions they want to answer is they need something more general a, a so-called a non-perturbative kind of general version of string theory and sometimes people now call it m theory so if you want we can call it m theory and they need an, an right, m theory right, right. And, and nobody knows what m theory is no one has come up you can write down a list of properties that you know, M theory is supposed to be some theory with this list of properties, but you can't actually write down a theory. And so on the one hand, you don't actually have a real theory that you can nail down and say, this is a theory, we're going to solve it and look at the solutions and see if they look like the real world. So what you what people end up doing is saying, well, we don't really know what the theory is. Let's assume that, but it seems that maybe there's one that has some properties that look like the real world. So let, let's work with that. And and, and then try to constrain, see what constraints we can get out of it that will tell us, you know, are we seeing something like the real world? And then they just end up finding that, no, there aren't really useful constraints that you can get almost anything out of it. So you get this landscape of all possibilities. Yes, yes. And then, you know, 20 years ago, things got very weird when people just started to say, well, you know, instead of saying that normally if, if you have a theory, it can't predict anything because, you know, almost everything is a solution to it. You say, okay, well, that was a bad idea, and you move on. So mm-hmm. Instead, you saw people saying, oh, well, that's it just means the real world is, you know, all of these possible things exist in the real world, in the multiverse, and, yeah, and just for, you know, for anthropic reasons, we happen to live in this random one. And, you know, I mean, anyway, it's the, the fact that anyone ever took any of that seriously is just still kind of, I don't have any explanation for it. It's just bizarre. Yeah. Okay, so to summarize... Somewhere around, this is not a part of the story that was said, but somewhere around the 1960s, some amplitude called the Veneziano, I think, Veneziano. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, Veneziano. Just read it. Veneziano, yeah. That was the first inklings of string theory, and it had to do, it was come up with because of the strong force. They were trying to solve something. Then it was forgotten about. And then around the 1980s, there were some other problems with string theory that were solved. And so this is the Green Schwartz anomaly cancellation. Yeah. And then some people say that that was the first revolution, but. It's also more accurate to say that that precipitated Ed Witten to take it seriously, and then that's what precipitated the first string revolution. Yeah. Okay, then from there, then you realize that there are different ways, something like 5 to the 100 or 10 to the 500 or some extreme amount that if you were to do some yeah. napkin calculation, all those books behind you, the amount of words ever written, not just books ever published, yeah. words ever written, I think easily letters ever written, like single letters, it would be like saying, find this one letter in every single book that's ever been written, including all the ones that have been on fire and under the water and so on. Okay, that's not such a problem if you can figure out how to reduce the search space. But if you can't, then it turns out the problem is NP complete, which means you just have to brute force. Is that a correct summary? Well, actually, maybe to go back to one thing and say, yeah, yeah, so this is one part of the story I didn't say is that you know, string theory had originally come out as a potential theory of the strong interactions. And that that actually was one reason Witten, I think, was looking at it, is that so one of the open problems that the st- standard model left open was how do you solve the strong? We had this strong interaction theory, but how do you solve it? And it looked like maybe you could you could use the old ideas about strings to solve it. And I actually spent a lot of time learning about strings as a graduate student because of that. And that was really to win, but 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 the, the the problem with um this kind of multiplicity of of solutions of string theory of mm-hmm. it, is that it, it's not just that there are too many of them. It's just that the, you don't actually have a definition of the problem. You know, so 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 people this kind of drives me crazy. People often talk about well, the problem is that we don't know how to put a measure on the space of solutions of string theory. And because if we could put a measure, then we could figure out, you know, and maybe it's concentrated in some place, right? Near where, and that would be great. But um, I, I keep pointing out that the problem is not that you don't have a measure of the space. The problem is that you have no idea what the space is. As I was saying, the you know, to even define what a string theory solution is requires knowing precisely what M theory is. You don't know it. There are no equations anyone can write down, which. You say, you know, if we were smart enough and and we look and could could find all the solutions to this, this would, you know, these are all the solutions to string theory. I mean, you just don't don't have that. So all of the things that you do have, like you can go out and say, well, 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 maybe it's these gadgets and you have 10 of the 500 of them or whatever. Those are all just kind of 
cook, cook together possible approximations to, to to what you think might be a string theory solution. Those are not, there are, you know, there, there, there are solutions to some equations you've written down, which are not, they are not the equations of string theory. There's something you, you, you wrote, you wrote down and think maybe this, these things have something to do with string theory. So th- the problem is, is much worse than any of these practical problems of there's too many of these things. Great. And, yeah. And this whole business, yeah, and now it's become kind of an industry that, well, let's apply machine learning techniques to this. And it's just, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're just applying. Anyway, you're, you're just. Does this frustrate it, it, you? Yes. I mean, it, it's this data is garbage. You know, so you you basically are throwing, you, you basically do not actually know what your problem is. So you're cooking up something which you which you can feed to a computer but but it, it actually is kind of known to be garbage and and you're doing processing on this and producing more garbage and and, and you know getting grants to do this and going around telling people that you're looking for the for the universe i mean it, it, it's real that's just utter nonsense i'm sorry many people don't know because they don't know the history but since 2010s, it's become somewhat cool to dunk on string theory, at least in the popular press. <laughs> okay. Maybe not inside academia. But you were alone, you and Lee Smolin were lone wolves, early lone wolves. Yeah, yeah. Can you so, talk about that and talk about some of the flack you took? Maybe still take. Yeah, anyway, it was certainly a very strange experience, a very ta- strange time. But, you know, I, I think the thing to say is that, you know, throughout, you know, I, I was never. I was always fairly skeptical about, about string theory, but, you know, initially for many years, my attitude was, well, you know, who knows, you know, Britain's very, certainly very smart. These people are, are you know, they're going to sooner or later, they'll figure out for them, either they'll figure out this works or they'll, or they'll, or they'll do something else. But then, you know, just as time went by, years went by and then this was just not happening. And, and you had more and more kind of popular books. You know, I, I have to confess, maybe in some sense, it's somewhat of a reaction to uh, to Brian Greene, to, who is uh, my friend and colleague here in uh, at Columbia. But, uh, you know, so he did a very, very good job of with PBS specials convincing the world that, you know, this this was a, a successful, this was a, a, an idea on the way to success when it, when it really wasn't. Uh, so mm-hmm. I thought, OK, well, so somebody should, you know, sit down and, and, and write a book about, you know, what the real situation here is. And it, it and. You know, it's not like when I talk to people privately about this, you know, I would say that people who are not string theorists mostly would 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 say, yeah, you know, yeah, you're probably right. I, you know, this is not this doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but, you know, whatever. And then the um and people and when I talk to string theorists, I have plenty of string theorist friends. They would often say, yeah, you know, yeah, there are a lot of huge problems and we, we just we don't really know anything better to do right now. So we're going to keep doing this. But, yeah, yeah, all these problems you're pointing out are really. Uh, uh yeah they're real and um so what's wrong with that well it, it, it was the the weird thing was i think it was this disjunct disjunction this disjunction between the private opinions of people what people were saying to each other privately what you privately and what you were seeing in in the popular press and you know you've so and and, and there was you know and one aspect of this was people not wanting to kind of publicly criticize some something um and and partly you know, that and i think the subject became more and more kind of ideological and and the you know string theorists kind of started to feel kind of embattled they were very well aware that a lot of their colleagues thought what they were doing was not working on the other hand you know so so so, so, so they became more more defensive and um there was a lot more it became and a lot of people i think felt would tell me, yeah, you know, you're, yeah, you know, I agree with a lot of your saying, but yeah, but don't quote me on this publicly. I don't want to get involved in, you know, mm-hmm. in, in that mess and in alienating a lot of my colleagues and who are anyway. So, but I, I have this weird status that I'm actually in a, in a math department, not a physics department. And, you know, I don't have a lot of the same reasons that you don't want to annoy some powerful people in physics, like, you know, trying to get grants, get your your students' jobs, et cetera, et cetera, where it didn't really apply to me. So I thought, well, you know, if somebody is going to kind of explain ah, what's going on here, it might as well be me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. And I, so, so I started writing this in around 2002, 2003. And uh, it, it, the book was finally published. It took It was a long story about getting it published, but it finally got published in 2006. And in the meantime, Lee Smolin had been writing a, 
a book. He, he was coming from a different direction. Trouble with physics. Yeah, the trouble with physics, and he was, um, you know, he he had his own motivation. So it was trying to write something I think more more general and sociological. But with this as an example, and I think the way he describes it, the example kind of took over the general theory, and so he ended up also writing a book about string theory, and uh, and the books ended up coming out at the same time, which I think, you know, it, it was kind of a force multiplier there that you know people if one person is writing a book which says well you know a lot of the things mm, you're hearing you're I hearing see. are not I right see. or people say well that's just one person's opinion but if two people are do it are saying thing everybody's like oh you know there must be something to this and so I, I think the the combination of the two books i think you know, it did have a lot of effect on um it, it, it did make a lot of people realize there was a problem here it made the, a lot of the strength there is you know much more, much more defensive. I mean, it also caused, I think, a lot of people, young people thinking of doing string theory or people doing string theory to decide to move on to something else. But, um, so, so they, they, they um, people very often tell me uh, that, you know, about effects this book had on, on them or other people they knew, um, in terms of their d- decisions about, you know, what to do with their research or their career. The book is called Not Even Wrong. Not even wrong the links yeah. to all resources mentioned will be in the description including this book. So you mentioned that your colleagues would talk to you privately and then they would say something else to the popular press. Now, when you say popular press, are you also including grant agencies with that? Like just the public in general? Because it's not just a popular science issue. It's also a grant issue where the money goes. Yeah. So it's not just the popular press. And and to be clear, I should say, it's not that they would say one thing, one place. The other thing, it's just they would carefully just not say, you know, that there were things that they would say in conversation with me, or I think in conversations with other people, not just me, that they would just say, okay, this is not something that. Okay. Sin of commission versus omission. Yeah. It, it, it's not like they were, they were going out and saying, oh, strength theory is going great. It's just that, you know, anyway, they were, they were, they were not kind of, they were not saying this is really a, appears to be a failure. Um, but, uh, yeah, but but yeah, but you're, you're right. It, it, this this issue kind of occurs at all levels, from you know the the very very popular press, from kind of television specials, um, to you know more more serious popular press. There's what 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 gets into Scientific American, you know what what gets into uh, now we have Quantum magazine, you know which are more 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 serious uh, parts of the mm-hmm. parts of the press aimed at the more at the, at the public to um you know all the way down to it yeah to exactly um yeah you know, like in, in grand proposal you know what, what do you write in in grand proposals whatever or if you um if you're anyway you're trying to explain to some some kind of funding person or, or, or something about what you know what's what's going on in your subject do you um <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, what, what do you say about string theory? And so, the, 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 you know, the string theorists, I think, have often, you know, that they've, well, I think everybody, whatever you're working on, you're often forced by this business of getting your students a job or getting a grant to be, you know, to, to say, to go right up to up to the boundary of what's defensible in, 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 in being optimistic about what you're doing. But, um, and they're, you know, so that's what string theorists have certainly always been always been doing you could argue you know in many cases it's not different than what other other scientists do but it's um i i, I think the, re, the the thing which i i have to say i have found more and more disturbing the reaction of and and this started when my book came out and i think lee small had a similar reaction the um I, I think both of us were expecting a much more serious intellectual response to the issues we were raising um you know, we, we were raising serious, serious, serious technical questions and we were getting kind of back, you know, kind of, you know, per, personal, personal attacks and from people in the community or from the public, from people in the, you know, from people in the community. I mean, I think, you know, what, what you're getting from, 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 from people who don't in the public don't know much about this You're you're getting some completely random combination of people who are annoyed because you're saying something different than what they heard and other people who become your fan because you're saying something different. And so you end up with, sure, sure. You end up with a huge okay. number of, of fans who you don't necessarily want as your fans. But anyway, the, the uh, yeah, so both of us were expecting, you know, that, you know, we were, we'd put a lot of effort into making a, you know, a serious intellectual case about what these problems were. 
And instead of getting a serious re response, we were getting, um, you know, you know, these kind of personal attacks of how dare you say this. And so, for instance, you know, there's one prominent blogger who um, decides who would write these endless blog entries about what's wrong with Peter White and what he's doing. And and at some point, I was trying to respond to these. And at some point, I realized, you know, what this guy's talking about has nothing to do with what I actually wrote in my book. And then and and then he actually kind of publicly admitted that he was refusing to he refuses to read the book. Hmm. So this is a anyway, this kind of blew my mind. How can you be an academic and engaged in, you know, and academic discussion of intellectual issues and and you're you're spending all this time arguing about a book and and you're refusing to read it i mean how it's just really crazy and that was a string theorist yeah or just a colleague yeah okay that's a string theorist yeah so, so speaking a, of brian green oh sorry continue please no, no, yeah no yeah no that, that it wasn't brian green <laughs> <laughs> no 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 I, I, anyway i didn't mean to suggest that no 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 but but any but anyway that's just one example so and, and i and i think you know this is an ongoing i think disturbing situation that um People are just not. People are kind of defending that that field and continue and research there with just kind of refusing to acknowledge the problems or to have kind of serious discussions of it. And I think you know, I, you're you're on your last your last thing with with uh, Edward Frankel. I think it's it's kind of funny because he, you know, I know him and I, and I actually was out visiting him in Berkeley in June or something. And we're talking about things, and he told me, "Oh, Peter, I'm you know I'm going to go to the strings conference, and this is the first time I've been to a strings conference." And um, mm -hmm. and you know he's heard me go on about this for, and he's kind of nodded his head politely, and you know he said, "Well, I'm a mathematician, I'd rather not, you know." But th this sounds a little yeah. bit you know, maybe Though Peter's he's published a, with Witten. Yeah, and, and you know, so he, he and he knows all these people, he, and he you know he knows a lot about the story, but but he and and I think you know he knows me well know enough that I'm, you know I'm. You know, I, I have a somewhat. So I'm, I'm not a complete fool, and I have a somewhat serious point of view. But you know, maybe I'm really a, a bit too extreme about this. But then he went to the this conference. And then after when he comes back, he gives me a call and says, basically, you know, Peter, I didn't realize how bad it really was. You're right that this this really is as bad as you're you've been saying. So it was a anyway. What was bad? The exuberance of the young people or the old people telling, misleading the younger people into a, a useless pit or like what was what was bad yes it is as bad as you say well i i think what what's what's bad is is, is really just this kind of this kind of refusal to admit i mean this is a field which intellectually has serious problems things have not worked out I, these ideas really have failed to work and instead of admitting that some that ideas have failed and moving on people will just kind of keep acting as if that's not true and uh yeah and, and so the um you know I, I think sorry to interrupt i'm so sorry so why would edward expect an admittance of the failure of string theory at a strings well, conference I, I think one thing to say you know i mean part of the story about him is is you know he's a he's a mathematician and and you know so so mathematicians if you do mathematics the one thing you have to be completely clear about is you know what do you understand and what you don't understand and what is a wrong idea and what is a right idea you know, and if something doesn't work and is wrong, you have to, you can't play a game. You cannot play any games about this. This is, you know, you have to admit that this is wrong. And so I, I think especially for mathematicians to come in and see an environment where there's, you know, the kind of guiding ideas that people haven't really, haven't really worked out. And, and a lot of things, you know, are known, do not work for known reasons, but people are still kind of acting as if this is not true and trying to figure out how to kind of do something and make career for themselves in, you know, in, in this mm -hmm. environment, it, it, it's a very, you know, I think he, 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 he recognized that, but it is part of it is the, um, I mean, mathematics is a very unusual subject that people, things, things really are wrong or right. And you, and, and you're, you, you know, it's, you absolutely, absolutely cannot seriously make progress on the subject unless you recognize that. And, uh, and, and, and mathematicians are also much more used to um they're much more used to being wrong. I think one of my colleagues, John Morgan, likes to say that uh, you know, mathematics is the is the only subject he knows of where, you know, if two people disagree about something and they each think the other is wrong, they'll go into a room and sit down and 
talk about it. And then they'll emerge from the room with one of them having admitted he was wrong. The other one was right. And that this is just not, it's not a normal human behavior, but it's something that mm -hmm. you know, is part of the mathematical culture. Earlier, I said, speaking of Brian Greene, and what I meant was I had a conversation with Brian Greene about almost a year ago now. And I mentioned, yeah, so Peter White has a potential toe, Euclidean twister unification. And then he said, oh, does he? Oh, I didn't know. He is in your university. Not to put you on the spot, but why is that? Well, I, it's said aloud. I don't think it's true by the professor of physics, mainly who studies string theory. Well, there's so many proposals for toes. Yeah, there are proposals in your inbox, but there aren't serious proposals by other professors. There aren't that many serious proposals of theories yeah. of everything, at least not on a monthly yeah. basis. Well, I mean, I, I mean, this is this really doesn't have anything in particular to do with Brian. You could you could ask, you know, since you know people in this subject, you know, in principle should be interested in this. There's I've gotten very little reaction from from physicists to this, and 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 in some sense, it's kind of clear clear why. I mean, there, you know, I wrote this I wrote this paper. I read about the blog, and and you know. I, I, I've gotten no reaction in, in both cases. I, I don't have reaction from people writing, telling me that I've, that I've talked to about it or that are, that are saying, that, oh, you know, this is, this, this is, this is wrong. This can't work for this reason. But, well, I think that this is, this is very, very much the problem with the, the, the paper that I wrote about this. It, it's very, it uses some quite tricky understanding of how of how twisters work and twister geometry works which is not is not is, is something that very few physicists have so so brian it would mm. i'd be i'd be completely shocked if brian actually really understood some of the things going on with twisters that i've been that I'm talking about and and the problem i think for anybody who then if somebody comes to you and says oh i have this great idea it involves you know these these subtle subtleties of twister theory and and you're like well you know, I'm really not in the mood to spend a week or so sitting down trying to understand the subtle as a twister theory. So I think, you know, maybe I'll just nod my head politely and then and, and go on go on my way. That's part of it. And then part of it is also that a, a lot of you know, th this is very much a speculative work in progress. You know, I'm seeing a lot of very interesting things happening here, but I'm not um I in no sense have completely understood what's going on or or have the kind of uh you, you know understanding of this where you can write write this down and, pe and people really understand can follow exactly what exactly what's going on so um it, it, it's not too surprising i haven't got that much i can see why I understand the typical reaction to this and um I mean, it, brian is somewhat of a special case because i mean he, he also actually is very um I, I think actually he actually a lot of his effort is as is, is go as in recent years has gone into other things, especially the mm -hmm. uh, I mean the World Science Foundation festival I think is now more or less uh you know it, it's kind of most of, it's mostly Brian Green at this point yeah and then it's uh so he's anyway he, he's thinking about other things um and and I have very I don't have, I have very little contact with people in the physics department I mean they're mostly thinking about very different things and it's it's kind of a sad fact. Here at Columbia, but 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 it's true essentially everywhere else that the, you know, the mathematicians and physicists really don't talk to each other. They're really separate silos, separate languages, separate cultures, and um, you know, places where you have kind of mathematicians and physicists and kind of active and uh, high level interaction with each other is is very unusual. It, it doesn't it doesn't happen very much. I have a couple of questions again. I'll say two of them just so I don't forget them and then we can take them in whichever order you like. So one of the questions is how slash why did you get placed into the math department? Because so that's one question. And then another one is you mentioned earlier that Witten has this power to survey a vast number of people and extract the ideas at great speed. And so a large part of that is raw IQ, like sheer intellect. But is there something else that he employs like a technique that you think others can emulate? I imagine if Witten was to read your paper, he would understand it. And I imagine that he would see, oh, he would see the benefit of it. And maybe the application to string theory, or maybe it offshoots in its own direction. But anyhow, so those are two separate questions. One about Witten, and then one about you and the department you're in. Okay, yeah, I've got, yeah, they're, they're two very different. Let, let me start, let me, let me just say, say something just quickly about Witten, just, just saying about you know, having dealt with him over the 
the years. You know, one thing I that I find very interesting about him is, is just, you know, you know, he tra he travels around a lot, and you know, he, but but he, he, let's just say let's just say his way of socializing is to, you know, if he's come to a to come to a department and he's at T or whatever, he'll you know, and he's introduced to anybody, he almost immediately will ask him, okay, well, what what are you working on? You know, explain it to me. And so, so just a lot of what, anyway, that's a lot, a lot of what, what he's done over the, over the years has, has just been, has just been, you know, trying to really be aware. And, um, you know, anyway, I, I've said what I've been doing and try to get him interested. He's, um, I don't know, he, he's, anyway, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Maybe I'll have more success with it, with this new paper, maybe not, but, um, he's, uh, he's responded though, or no, he, he, he has responded, but, um, I would, but it's more that he's kind of kind of lo looked at it. He actually, the first version, he actually made some technical comments more about the beginning of it. But I think he, um, but he didn't engage with with with, with most of what I was talking about. We're going to get back to the math question soon, the math department question. Yeah. But do you think a part of that is because there's a sour taste given your book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I, I've again, I've known him since I was an undergraduate. You know, I think you know he's. I think he's aware. You know, th this guy is is not an idiot, but but he's also. I'm also not his favorite person in terms of kind of you know the impact I've had on his on his, his subject. And um, yeah, and, and I think you know he also. I think he understands it's not personal, but you know it's not. Uh, it's very hard to deal with somebody who's kind of, you know, been this kind of main figure, kind of telling the world that the thing that. You, you think is your main accomplishment in life it, it is wrong. So this is not, yeah. Anyway, I'm not his favorite guy, but, but anyway, I can, we're, we're still, I can sure. still it's, it's, it's fine. He's, he, yeah, you know, I think, I think he's a very, you know, anyway, anyway he, he's a very ethical and very, and I, and I think when I complain a lot of, a lot of, most of the worst of what the kind of, it's kind of this kind of pushing of string theory in, in ways which, which really were completely indefensible. It's, he, he's mostly been not, you know, he's he's rarely been the worst offender in that. I mean, mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. really, that's really other more more other people than him. But um, yeah. but yeah, he he's a he he's a true believer. He's really enthusiastic about it. He still is. Okay. So to get back to my own personal story, so what happened? You know, so I went. I got a postdoc at, at the Stony Brook Institute for Theoretical Physics in '84, and I was there for four years, and that was the in the Physics Institute. But but the Physics Institute was right above. It's the same building as the Math Building. And so, and, and the, the things I was interested in, I was trying to stay away from string theory and had some, was interested in some other things. And, you know, I was often talking and I was, I was trying to learn a lot of mathematics. I was trying to learn more mathematics to see if I could make any progress on these other problems. So I spent a lot of time talking to the mathematicians in Stony Brook. And some of them, you know, there, there's some really great geometers. There are some really great mathematicians and I learned a lot from them. And it was a, that was a great experience. But at the end of four years there, you know, I needed another job. I did set out some applications for postdocs in physics, but the, I would say that that was kind of the height of the excitement over string theory. And especially somebody like me saying, you know, I'm really interested in doing something ma about the mathematics and physics, about applying mathematics and physics, but I don't want to do string theory. That was just, that was not, I was not going to get any, any kind of a reasonable kind of job that way. That's just not going to happen. So, um, Anyway, so so I, I ended up realizing, well, maybe the better thing, I'll, I'll have better luck in in a math in a math department, and getting make. And so I um ended up going up, to spending a year in in Cambridge as kind of a, a unpaid visitor at Harvard, partly, and I was also teaching calculus at Tufts. And so, so then I had some kind of credential. Okay, well, at least this guy can teach calculus. And so, and I and I applied for a post a one year postdoc at uh, the Math Institute in Berkeley, MSRI, and. I, I and I got that, and so I spent a year. Is that how you got to know Edward? Um, no, no, he he wasn't. Uh, that was before him. Yeah, I mean, he he would have still been been at Harvard and a much more junior person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came to Berkeley later. Yeah, no, that that was like eighty, eighty eight, eighty nine. I mean, and, and and but that was an amazing. That was actually a fascinating year because that was the year that Witten had come out. Witten had kind of dropped string theory for a while. And was doing this topological quantum field theory stuff and Chern Simons theory. And he was doing the stuff which won him the Fields Medal. And, you know, it was just, just mind blowing. Yeah. Bringing together of ideas about mathematics and quantum field theory. And, um, 
So, so most of the year was devoted to learning about that and thinking about that. And, you know, Witten came and visited and Atia was there and I actually had a lot of chance to talk to him, which was wonderful. And, um, so that, that was, so that was a really fascinating year at a MSRI, but, and partly because, because so much of this was going on, um, you know, math departments were more interested in hiring somebody like me, even though I didn't have the usual credentials because they felt this is somebody who actually understands this new subject, which is having a lot of impact on our field. So, so Columbia hired me to, um, this non-tenure track for your position. Uh, and, uh, so I was do that. I was, I was teaching here. And, um, after a few years, again, I was getting the point, okay, well now I got to find another job, but, um, and they, so, 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 so the, the department needed somebody to, um, they'd set up a position for somebody to teach a course and maintain the computer system. And, and then, and, and I said, well, you know, I, I can probably do that. And that, that, that's not a bad job. And so I ended up, uh, agreeing, agreeing to take on that position. And that's, that's, uh, that's always been kind of a renewable position. It's not tenured, but it's, um, essentially permanent re renewable. And I've gone through various kinds of titles of, various kinds of versions of that since I've been since the nineties and it's, it's worked out very well for me. I'm actually quite, quite happy with how it's worked, but it's a very unusual career path. And it's, and it, it has given me a lot of insulation from the normal kind of pressures to perform in certain ways and to do certain things it allowed me to, to get away with all sorts of things, if you like. Mm -hmm, like what? Well, like write, writing a book called not even wrong, explaining why what's wrong with, <laughs> How did that come about? So, for instance, this is going to be incorrect because I'm just making this up, but then correct it. For instance, you're walking along someday, you have this idea, maybe it's a splinter in your thumb for a different reason about string theory. So then you go to a publisher and you say it, or you say it to a journalist, and then the journalist hears it and they say, you should write a book. And you say, maybe, and then you think about it, you start writing a chapter. The nitty gritty details, how does that happen? How did it go from Peter White mathematics professor to then yeah. writing this popular book um well i mean so so yeah th throughout let's say throughout the 90s you know i was very much um you know I, i'd always you know I, I was interested in the same kind of questions like, can you do different things in math and physics i was trying to follow what's going on in physics and i've been trying to follow what's going on in string theory and i was getting more and more frustrated throughout the late 90s that this what I would see in the public and what I would see or just to not reflect my own understanding of what actually was going on. And, uh, partly I kind of mentioned, you know, so you know, there's a, there's a, for instance, Brian's PBS special about the alien years. I mean, it, it just, that just seemed to me to be giving that just didn't really didn't agree at all with, 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 with what, what I would actually saw going on. And so I thought, well, somebody, you know, some, somebody should, write this up and I would have hoped it would be somebody else. But then as you go along, there's no one else is going to do this. And, you know, I'm actually pretty well placed to do it for, for very re reasons and started thinking about it. And I think around 2001, I actually wrote kind of a short thing. that's on the archive of kind of, you know, a little bit of a kind of polemical several page thing. You say, look, look here, here's the opposite side of the story. Here's what's, this is really not working and here's why. And that, that was the beginning of it. And like, I got a lot of reaction reaction to that and and i started to more and more feel that you know you, you the right way to do this was to actually you needed to write something kind of at book sit down and at, at book length explain exactly what's going on and and i also wanted to do something also more positive to try to explain some of the things that i was seeing about how mathematics you know there, there were some very positive things happening in the relationship between mathematics and physics which has some connections to string theory but were also quite independent like Witten's Chern Simons theory, for instance. So I also wanted to also write about um so I was I also kind of wanted to write about the story of what's going on in this kind of physics and this kind of fundamental physics, but kind of informed by, you know, someone who's who's actually learned spent a lot of time in, in the math community and, and informed by 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 a lot more mathematics than is usual in the um in this thing. So so there there was kind of a, a positive <laughs> it's rarely noticed, but there there are a bunch of chapters in this book, like on topological quantum field theory, yeah, nothing to do with string mm -hmm. theory, which uh, nobody mm -hmm. really paid much attention to or understands. But, but anyway, so I I wrote this, and and I was so I just said, well, I'll just write this thing, and I think I around then I may have also had a friend who had, he'd he'd done a book proposal and written a book, and but by the time he'd actually 
was writing the thing, you know, he was just kind of sick of it and he didn't really want to be writing it, but somebody had given him an advance and he had to, so he had to write the book. So I thought, well, you know, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to go out and make a proposal to a publisher. I'm just going to write what I want to write and we'll see what it, how it turns out. And, you know, I think we'll, 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 we'll see if, if someone wants to publish it. Great. And, um, so then I was getting to, to the end of this and somebody from Cambridge University Press showed up. He was just in my office going around asking people, you know, what are you working on? Is there some kind of book project we could work on? And I told him about what I was doing and he got very, very interested in it. Hmm. And so it, it it actually then became, um, you know, uh, Cambridge University Press was then considering it for a while and <laughs> they they sent it out to various for reviews and, and and the reviews were kind of fascinating. There were half the reviews said, this is great. This is wonderful. Somebody is finally saying this, this is fantastic. And the other half said, oh, this is absolutely awful. This was, this will destroy the reputation of Cambridge University Press. So interesting. And the problem with the University Press is, you know, they, they're not, um, they're actually not really, they're not really equipped to do con to deal with that kind of controversy. I mean, they, they've got, they have like boards of so-and-so that have to vote on their, on, on, on everything. And they, um, they're very pretty conservative institutions. So at some point it became un pretty clear that things were not going well there. And so I sent it around to a bunch of people and anyway, and, and one person I sent it around to was um, Roger Penrose and he, he ended up being get, getting interested in it and, and asked me if he, he, he could, uh, uh, sent it to his publisher and, and and they ended up publishing it. Oh, great. Yeah. He's yeah. not a fan of string theory either. No, no. Super yeah. Symmetry. yeah. So he definitely agreed with me about, about that. Yeah. 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 Now that you're in the math department, is that what allowed you to see the connections between twister theory and the Langlands program? Or is that something oh, yeah. that existed before? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> the connection, not the Langlands program, obviously that goes back to Langlands. Well, oh no, I, I whether there is, I, I think it's still, you know, whether there is any connection between Twister Theory and the Lang program, that, that's a very, that's extremely speculative idea and fairly reasonable, I would say, yeah. Yeah, so that... What aspect of the Langlands program? Like the local or geometric? Well, maybe maybe to, to back up a little bit, I mean, I, so the, the Langlands program is, anyway, this amazing story, I guess you heard a lot about it from Edward, but it, it um, it, it's, uh, one reason I got into it is it became more and more clear to me that the right way to think about quantum mechanics and quantum field theory issues was in this language of representation theory, that that was the language of, and, and then it started to say, to, so, okay, well, I should learn as much as possible about what mathematicians know about representation theory. And, 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 and you, 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 sooner or later you learn about, you, you find out about the language program and the language program is saying that all of the basic structure of how the integers work and how numbers work and things is, you know, closely related to represent to, to this representation theory of Lie groups and in, in this amazing, amazing, amazing way. And, and there's just, the, there's, there's just an amazing set of ideas that ideas behind the geometric language program, which, you know, they have a lot of similar flavor to the things I was seeing in, in some of physics. So it was, you know, I, I've just been, it's just been a many, many years process of slowly learning more and more about that. And, um, but, but, but that stuff never really had anything to do with twisters. And, uh, so the one, the, the interesting, the, the, the interesting relation to twisters is, is that, um, you know, I, I had actually, I had actually written th this, this paper. I'd given some talks about, um, about the twister stuff. And, and I'd pointed out that, you know, that in this way of thinking about things, the, um, you know, there, there's this thing that there's this thing that I told you that a, a point, a space-time point, is supposed to be a complex plane. Well, it, if you take this complex, actually, in Euclidean space, it, it, it's something you can think of it as a complex plane, or you can mod out by the constants and use the the real structure of Euclidean space, and and, and you and you you get something, a geometrical object corresponding to each point, which is called the twister P1. It, it it's basically a, a sphere, mm -hmm. but you identify opposite end points of the sphere, and and so I'd ex written about that in the uh, in my paper and and, so, and and some of the talks I was given, I kind of emphasized that, and then um so then I, I get an email one some day, one day from um uh, Peter Schulze, who's one who's one of the um 
people is making this really great progress in the language program in number theory and 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 it's been coming up with some of these fantastic new ideas relating geometric langlands and arithmetic langlands and he said and he ba basically said yeah no I was, I just i was looking at this talk you gave and and you know it's really nice about this geometry and and seeing this twister p1 going there he said what's amazing is this twister p1 is exactly that same thing is showing up in my own work you know if you um there's this work he was doing on the on on the on the geom the relation of geometric Langlands and, and if you specialize to what happens kind of as a at the infinite prime or at the the real place not 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 at finite primes the structure he was seeing was exactly the twister p1 so I mean he kind of pointed this out to me and and, and asked and asked me some other questions about the about this I don't think I could tell him anything useful but um but that that kind of that kind of that did kind of blow my mind that wait a minute this this thing that i'm looking at in physics that exactly the same structure is showing up in this in this really these new ideas about yeah geometry of numbers and you know, and so um so i said i then spent a few months kind of learning everything i could about that mathematics and twister p1 and i'm still following it but but you know i, I should say that you might know, so to my mind it, it's just uh it's just a, a completely fascinating thing that these these new things that we're learning about the geometry of number theory and these these speculative ideas about about, about physics that that you're seeing a same fundamental structure on both sides and and but but I have no I, I mean I have, I have no understanding of, of of how these are related I don't think anyone else does either yeah. yeah have you asked Peter if he would like to collaborate well there's not is that like uncouth no, but 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 I, I think he, he he and I just have very, you know, I mean, <laughs> maybe too incompatible. No, 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 no. It, it's just you know he's doing, you know, he's doing what he's doing. I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, one thing to say is you know, he's having such incredible success and doing such amazing stuff that you know interfering in it with that anyway and telling about oh why don't you stop doing what you're doing and do something uh -huh. i'm interested in seems to be a really bad idea but uh it's um anyway so 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 yeah so he, he's doing extremely well in doing what he's doing and most of what he's doing isn't related to this i mean he's you know he really really understands in an amazing way what's going on with the geometry of piadic numbers and these things like this which i don't understand at all and so and he's just been revolution oh. he's been revolutionizing that subject and um it, it's something i can only kind of marvel at from a distance the kinds of issues that where i'm kind of stuck that are kind of for me are are actually much more they really have nothing to do with his expertise they're really kind of more more you might probably should be talking to more physicists or whatever so he's um yeah but uh I mean, it's certainly, I think it's in the back of his mind. Oh, you know, this, this stuff that I'm seeing, I should, should every so often look and, and think about what, if I can understand the relation to physics. And it's in the back of my mind, the stuff that I'm seeing physics, I should try to keep learning about that number theory stuff and see if I see anything. But, but that's really all it is. And, so, but, but a lot of this is very new. I, I, um, I just heard from him a few weeks ago that, you know, he actually, he actually has some new idea about this, about this particular problem from his point of view. And um, he was supposed to give a talk about it on um, last Thursday at this conference in, in Germany. And I'm hoping to get a report back of that. But so, but, but th this is all very active and very poorly understood stuff, but it's, it's, it's yeah. not, um, but definitely the connection between math and physics here is very, very unclear, but, but I, I'm, if there is one, it will be mind blowing. And I'm, 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 it's certainly kind of on my agenda in the future to try to learn more and look for such a thing, but but I don't have anything positive to say about that, really. So I want to get to space time is not doomed. There's quite a yeah. few subjects I still have to get to. <laughs> I want to be mindful of your time. But how about we talk about space time not being doomed? It's something yeah. that's said now. I don't know if you know, but there's someone named Donald Hoffman who frequently cites this. He's not a physicist, but he cites it as evidence or as support for his consciousness as fundamental view. And then there's Nima Arkani Hamed, who's the popularizer of that term, though not the inventor. Yeah, so, so maybe to, to, I mean, I can kind of summarize that. Yeah, so I, I don't really have anything useful to say about, about Hoffman. I mean, he's, so he's interested in consciousness and other things I don't really have too much I don't really know much about or I mean, it's useful to say, but maybe to say what the, um, I mean, th this has become, 
And I mean, the reason I wrote that there's this article you're referring to about space time is not doomed. I, I, I wrote partly because I was getting frustrated at how this had become such a so such kind of an, an, an ideology among people, among people in um, working in physics and <clears throat> on quantum gravity. That this this idea that and and I think what, what, one way I would say would say what's happened is that <clears throat> so. When people first started thinking about how do you get quantized gravity, how do you quantum gravity? So the, the initial one of the initial ideas was, well, you know, we've learned that we have this incredible successful successful standard model. So let's just use the same methods that work for the standard model and apply them to gravity, and we'll do that. And so it's going to be anyway. So and and, and, you're, and you're thinking of space and time in this usual way and then there are these degrees of freedom to live in space and time which which tell you about the the metric and and the geometry of space and time and you're trying to write a quantum theory of those things living in space and time and i think you know anyway people have tried to do this there, there's lots of problems with doing it. It, it it's an incredibly long story string theory was partly reaction to the story but even string theory was still a theory of strings moving around in space and time so you weren't yeah i mean you, you were still starting with thinking of, thinking in terms of a space and time but but more recently you know as string theory hasn't really worked out the way people ex expected there has been this ideology of oh well let's you know let's just get rid of this space and time somehow and and then and then we will write some theory in, in some completely different kind and in the low energy limit will recover space and time as some kind of effective structure which you only see at low energies and that's become almost an ideology like our connie Hammett likes to say space time is doomed mm -hmm. you know meaning the the truly fundamental theory is going to be in some other mm -hmm. variable variables and space time variables he, he has his own kind of proposals for this about <clears throat> these geometrical structures he's using to study amplitudes but I don't um anyway, but but anyway, the, the things that I'm do, that I'm doing, you you actually do get a theory. It looks like you know gravity should fit into this, and it will fit into this in a fairly standard way. Um this is this is standard space and time, except you know that in the, the twister geometry point of view on it, and interesting things happening with spinners you didn't expect, but it, it's still there is a usual idea about space and time are 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 there. So but my, my my general feeling with the um the the the, the, the problem with, with with this whole kind of space time is doom thing is you have to you, you have to have a plausible proposal for what you're going to replace it with it's all well and good to say that there's some completely different theory out there and the theory people are used to is just an effective approximation but you know first you got to convince me that your alternative proposal is it works and and the, and the problem is that people are just doing this without any kind of you know without any kind of plausible or interesting proposal for what it is you're going to replace space time with and and often and often it, it even comes down to this crazy level of kind of this multiverse thing i mean you know, we have this theory where everything happens so fundamentally everything happens but then effectively you only see space and time and it's kind of you know you can say words like that but it's, it's kind of meaningless Mm -hmm. Why is it that they have to come up with a decent proposal or replacement? Why can't they just say, look, there are some, with our current two theories, there's an incompatibility that suggests that space-time, quote-unquote, breaks down at the Planck level or maybe before. So, for instance, Nima's argument that if you were to measure anything with it classically, you have to put an infinite amount of information somewhere and then that creates a black hole. And then there's also something with the black hole entropy that suggests holography but that doesn't mean space time is doomed it's just a different space time yeah yeah, yeah. no but from my point of view i mean what 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 has become the focus of that field a lot is this is is are actually quite tricky you know very non-perturbative very kind of strong field problems about you know how well you know what's going to happen to the theory when you've got black holes and black holes are decaying and so You've kind of moved away from, I mean, but 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 the problem with the inconsistency between quantum mechanics and general relativity is a different that that is is normally that is normally the one everybody worries about is 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 normally a different problem. It, it's a very very local problem. It's just that if you um, it, 
if you think of this in, in terms of the standard standard kind of variables like like what's the the metric variables and you use you know the einstein hilbert action for the dynamics for these things if you try and apply standard ideas of quantum field theory locally to that at short distances you get these wrong renormalization problems and the theory becomes unpredictive so that that that's always been considered the, the real problem how do you deal how do you deal with that but instead of having a proposal to deal with that and having a a real mm -hmm. kind of a new idea about what what's really going to happen what you know what are the right variables at these short distances that will not have this problem what what, what are you going to do they kind of ignore that decided to ignore that problem and say well maybe string theory solves that problem who knows and and, and then to move on and to try to do you know something much much harder which is to, to to resolve these issues about what happens in black hole backgrounds and stuff and uh i don't yeah, I, I i i know but but it, it seems to me a kind, kind of a separate a separate issue you can still have space time and have these 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 issues about you know what's going to happen in in black hole backgrounds and stuff and, and you could still resolve them in different ways but but they're just they, they, they really it's it's a very frustrating subject i think find to, to actually to try to learn about you see people making these statements and then you say okay well what what exactly do they mean i mean it's all well and good to, to say these very vague things about this is doomed and what what about <laughs> infinite amount of information blah 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 but you know write down tell me what we're talking about here and there there really isn't a it's it, it's almost like comically impossible to kind of pin people down on what is the what are you talking what theory are you talking about and it and, and then finally when you pin them down you find out that what they're actually talking about is they've they're talking about some very very toy model they're saying well we don't know what's going on in four dimensions so let's try it in three dimensions and maybe two dimensions maybe one dimension and so they're talking about some mm. com comically trivial um toy model which they kind of ended up studying because well you could study it and then maybe there's some analogous problem happening in there and and that all they have are these kind of toy models which which actually don't seem to have any of the actual real physics of four-dimensional general relativity in them and that's what they're that's what they're all studying these days i see even nima well he, he, i mean he, he's somewhat different because he, he's coming at it from a different point of view he's coming at it from this point of view of, of really trying to see find new structures in the um in the perturbative expansions for um you know for standard quantum field theories so he's got a he's got kind of a specific program looking at um yeah i mean he's he's not he in general he's not studying toy models he's studying real four-dimensional um, right physical models but but they're not um but 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 they're 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 often mo they're generally models like Yang Mills theory where you know exactly where the theory is and, and it's not this is this isn't solving the problem of quantum gravity or anything it's it's a it's well theory but I I, I think maybe, maybe I should I'm saying this a bit too quickly without thinking but 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 just to try to give a a flavor of what I think he thinks he's doing he's okay. he's he's trying to take a theory that you do understand well like Yang Mills theory and look at look at its perturbation series Feynman diagrams find new structures there and a new language and then see if you can build rebuild the theory in terms of these new structures and and and, and then then if you've got kind of a new way of thinking about quantum field theory in terms of these new different structures like his amplitude hedron or whatever then maybe you can then apply uh, once you've got a way of thinking in terms of those new structures you can go back to the problem of quantum gravity and and and, I see, and resolve I see. that yeah so i think he, but you know i don't think he he's not in any way as far as i know claiming to have actually gotten anywhere near there but he's yeah and and, and this, this gives you a, a lot to do there's a lot of interesting structure there there's a lot to work on and and so he and his collaborators have you know have, have done a huge amount kind of calculation with these things but i at least to my mind i i don't see them kind of coming up with what i think that they hope to come up with which is a a different geometric language for, for for that that really works and is really powerful for um that that's going to get you something new. Yeah.
Did you listen or watch Sean Carroll's podcast on the crisis in physics? Um, n- n- well, no, I, I, I skimmed through the, um, the, tra- the transcript of it. I was kind of wanted to see what he was. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly something I'm very interested in, but, uh, yeah, I, I thought I thought it was, anyway. I thought, I thought the whole thing, thing was actually quite strange because it, it, this is it's like four, four, four and a half hours long, and and it's just him talking. So he's just anyway. It, it's I thought the whole thing was, was actually very odd, and and, and it, it's it has something to do with kind of a the odd nature of the response to the um, you know to, to to criticisms in the subject. And so I think it, it was another kind of weird example. It's you know there's he's kind of wants to say something about this issue of, you know, that many people are now are now kind of very aware there is some kind of problem here and they're referring to it as a crisis in physics. But, um, you know, instead of, but, you know, but, but, but just kind of talking about it for four hours or four and a half hours yourself, is just kind of, kind of strange. Um, and, 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 and especially since he's got a podcast, one of the obvious things to do is to invite somebody on who, you know, thinks there is a crisis in physics. And if you don't, and he doesn't think there's one, it seems. And well, you could actually have an interesting discussion with this person for, for some mm-hmm. time. But instead of discussing some, this, it, it, it's like, you know, there, there's a controversy going on of two kinds. And instead of inviting somebody on to discuss this controversy with you or two people, you just go on for four hours about how your, your, your view that the other, you know, the other side is mm-hmm. wrong. It, just, it, it was very odd, I thought. Also, it wasn't as if he was arguing with the people that were saying that there's a crisis in physics. So when people say there's a crisis in physics, they generally mean that there's a crisis in high energy physics, particularly with coming up with fundamental law. And so what he was then taking it on to mean is there's a crisis in physics as a whole, like cosmology or astrophysics. Yeah. And then he's like, no, but look in solid state physics and the progress there. That's called a straw man where you're not actually taking on the argument. You're taking on a diminished version yeah. of it. Well, he was also often involved in these arguments over string theory with me and Lee in 2006. And it was often the same kind of thing that he's kind of, I mean, and the whole thing is just odd from beginning to end because he's actually not a string theorist. And this is, this is another weird sociological thing I found is that you find there, you find non-string theorist physics, physicists who somehow want to take a bit side in this and want to and have a big opinion about it and get emotionally involved in it, even though they actually don't know, don't actually understand the issues. This is not what they do. This is not their expertise. So, and, and um, so I don't know, I think so, so, some of this, you know, knowing, no, knowing Sean and, and what he's trying to do, I think he's not the only one who, who, who you see this phenomenon that, that there, there are people who, you know, they see what, what they want to, to do in the world is, is really to bring to the public an understanding of the power and the great things that the subject ha- has accomplished. And so he, and even in his four hours, he spends a lot of time, you know, giving very, very good explanations of, you know, various parts of the story mm. of the history of the, of, of the physics and the history of this. And, you know, they kind of see them, their goal in life is to kind of con- convince this, um, you know, the, the rest of the world who doesn't actually under, understand these great ideas or doesn't really appreciate them or is skeptical about them, you know, to, to bring them to them. And, and and I think part of I mean, the whole reason is I think he was kind of doing doing this or does this is because, you know, having people out there on Twitter or whatever saying, oh, you know, physics sucks, it's got all these problems, it's, it's all wrong, blah, 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 that this is, you know, this is completely against his whole goal in life is to stop this this kind of thing and to really get people to appreciate the subject. So he, and I think, in a kind of a misguided way, then and to enters into this from the point of view of oh, I have to stop the and this kind of crisis. People from saying things about a crisis in physics and get them to really appreciate, you know, that this really is a great subject and a wonderful subject. And it's um, but he kind of that goes too far and and, and then you know starts to defending things which really aren't defensible and things which he often doesn't really know much about. For instance? J- j- just the details of string theory. I mean, the, the, th- the reason I wrote this book is that some of these problems of, of string theory, these questions, you know, people will go on about ADS, CFT, and this, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is incredibly technical stuff. It, it, it's just, you know, to even understand exactly what these theories are that on both sides of the ADS, CFT thing, what is known about them, what are they... You know, 
what is the real problem here? What can you calculate? What can you not calculate? What can you not find? What can you not find? What happens in other dimensions? Mm -hmm. It's horrendously technical, and very few people actually really know it. But lots of people want to kind of get involved in discussions about it and argue about it without actually understanding actually what's going on. And part of the reason for writing the, not even on the book, but was to try to kind of, you know, to, to sit down and, and try to to write about 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 you know what what was really what was really going on what what the specific technical issues actually were you know as much as possible with it in in, in a somewhat non technical venue but um anyway so that that's some some of my reaction to this and and in particular I mean he just starts off the whole thing by he picked up on something from Twitter about somebody had found a paper from somebody had written in nineteen seventies complaining about how you know, there was a crisis. There wasn't any progress in the field, and this was a time when there was great progress in the mm -hmm. field. And mm -hmm. and this was a person who, honestly, just, somebody completely ignorant wrote a completely paper no one ever paid attention to in, in the mid nineteen seventies that that was wrong about about this. And he's he wanted to use that and as to kind of bludgeon the, the pe people who are making serious arguments about about the problems today. So I don't know. I, 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 I thought it was kind of a weird performance, but 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 it is. I think this is a good thing to ask, kind of people on this other side of this argument, string theory. Why there's very little willingness to actually engage in technical discussions publicly with people they disagree with. I mean, you know, I, Sean has never invited me to be on his podcast. He hasn't invited to be in a Hassenfelder. It's not um there 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 is no appetite for that at all among people in the in, in the subject and, and i think you know a lot of that is because you know they're they're well aware that you know they're, they're really serious difficult problems with this going whether you want to call it a crisis or whatever it is there's there are real problems and they're just not very interested kind of acknowledging and publicizing that yeah well i have a tremendous appetite for it and the people in the audience of the least <laughs> yeah, everything yeah, do so if ever <laughs> You have someone who you feel like would be a great guest with the opposite view that is defending string theory or the state of high energy physics, yeah. then please let me know and I will gladly host you both. <laughs> okay. I know we spoke about some people behind the scenes, some people who are likely to say yes and have a congenial conversation. Well, there's actually m most people are. I mean, there's um, the funny thing is actually early on in this, I, I, I was invited, um, a guy down at University of Florida invited me and, um, Jim, G Jim Gates uh -huh. to come and, and debate and debate string string theory, and so we um I think we really disappointed this big audience by by agreeing on on almost everything. <laughs> so you know he's a string he's a well known string theorist and and uh, and, and 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 you know and so we we actually found that I think things have uh, be interesting to do this to do this again now, but this was almost twenty years ago, but let me maybe a little bit, a bit less fifteen years ago and. You know, the way I would describe it then is, you know, if we started talking about the details, what our disagreements came down to where it was kind of more, you know, should you be out, you know, we would agree about the state of current things, but what do you think, where do you think this stuff is going? Are you optimistic? I, I see reasons why this can't work. He would see reasons why this is actually the best thing to do. He knows how to do and this might work. And, and, and there, it, it's, it's just that kind of, you know, Disagreement about ideas, which is uh, is perfectly reasonable, and and actually, um, Gates told me. I remember at the at, at at the end of when we were talking after this thing, he said, "Yeah, you know, I I was asked to like you know write a review of your book about it, and I thought, oh well, I'll just I'll pick up this book and I'll see you know he's, the guy's got it all wrong about string theory, or whatever." And then you know I read your book and I realized that you know a lot of what you were saying was the stuff about. Um, that the importance of representation theory in physics, and that, and I actually, you know, that that's actually exactly the way I see the what's important in physics. So I, you know, I find myself mm. agreeing with much of your your point of view and and, and the book. So I couldn't, I, I, I didn't. Anyway, so 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 that was, you know, I, and anyway, at, at the level of, of these these ideas, I think, you know, especially back then, I think there wasn't. Um, it's perfectly happy possible to have a reasonable discussion. Uh, it, I think I, th I think it, it has become weirder now. You know, twenty years later, they're really. You, you, I, I think it was a lot more possible to reasonably be an optimist back tw 
20 years ago and say, well, you know, the LHC is about to turn on. It's good. It's going to look for these super partners. Maybe they'll see super partners. There's, you know, we have all this stuff that might vindicate us. And um, we should, we, we, we're all hoping for that. But now, you know, the LHC has, has looked, the stuff is not there. There's really not. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, that's one thing that somewhat shocked me is people willing to, um, people who are often, to me or in public saying, look, you know, the crucial thing is going to be the results from the LHC. You know, we believe that you're going to see, we're going to see these super partners and this is going to show that we're on the right track. And then the results come in and, you know, you're wrong and you just, you just kind of keep going and without even kind of skipping a beat about how, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that, that, that's, I think. Yeah. Really... Well, there was a comment on your blog that said the LHC has just, it's great for string theory because it divides in half the moduli space. <laughs> anyway, you can make any kind of jo- joke you want, but, it, but you uh, know, I, I, that was certainly my feeling a lot when I was writing the book, whatever is that, you know, this is, this was going to be a crucial thing. This, um, the LHC, because either the LHC was going to see something along the lines of what these guys were advertising and which they were often willing to kind of actually bet money on, or it wouldn't. And then they would back down and start saying, okay, well, maybe, the critics have, mm-hmm. have a point, but um, no, I mean, it's just kind of amazing that people will just kind of completely ignore the, you know, the, the experimental results and keep going. About representation theory, for people who don't know what representation theory is, can you please give them a taste and then also explain okay. why is it important more so than say you want a group to act on something like, okay, yes, but how much more involved does it get than that? Well, anyway, yes. Yeah. So, 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 just to say that to, to give a flavor of what we're talking about, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's very common for people to talk about the importance in physics of symmetries, and um, and when you say that you know that it's important to study the symmetries of something, people often then just explain it in terms of of of, of a group. So, mathematically, a group is just a set with a you know, you know, you know, with a multiplication operation, you can multiply two elements to get another. But the um, the interesting thing about symmetries really is not so, is is actually not so much the groups, but the things that groups can act on. So what are the things that can be? So the standard example is like the group of rotations. You can pick things up and rotate them in three dimensional space. But what are all the what are all the things that you can kind of do rotations to? And um, so the, and and those are in, those in some sense are the representations or the representation theory is kind of the the linear version of that theory and and if you try to work with a group action on something it isn't nonlinear you can look at the functions on it and turn it into a linear problem but anyway so 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 group representation theory is really you know in it really is is the study of kind of of, of, of symmetries. What are, what are the possible symmetries of things? What are the possible things that can have symmetries? And and and, and it's really fu- it's really fundamental both in physics and it's really and in mathematics. And um, I mean, large fractions of mathematics you can put in this language of what are there is some kind of group and it's acting on some things. And what are the representations? You can. I mean, the amazing fact about the Langlands program and number theory is how much of number theory you can formulate in that language. And um, you can formulate a lot of ge- lots of geometry in this language. You can, it, it, it's kind of a unifying language throughout mathematics at a very deep level. Uh, but then, I mean, I, to, to me, the amazing thing is that the same, if, if you start looking at the structure of quantum mechanics, if you look at what are the, quantum mechanics is this weird conceptual structure that states are, state of the world is a vector in a complex vector space and you get information about it by self-adjoint operators acting on this thing um so from the that looks like a very very weird like where did that come from but if you if you look at that formalism it it fits very very naturally into the formalism of group representations it's really um uh and this is kind of why i I wrote this book uh, taught this course here and wrote a book about it about quantum mechanics from that point of view What's the book called? Um, Quantum Theory, Groups, and Representations, and Introduction. It's kind of a textbook. So it was the second book I wrote. Okay, and, that um, link will be in the description. Yeah, and there's also uh, a, a, a free version with kind of corrected, with errors that I know about corrected on my website. You can also link to that. No, we want people to pay. They have to pay okay, for the errors. They should pay for, 
<laughs> or you can buy it, or you can buy a copy from Springer if you like a hardcover book, or or whatever. But um, yeah. So 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 anyway, it really is kind of amazing. One of the things that's most fascinates me about quantum theory is, you know, that it, there is a way of thinking about it that it's not just some weird out of the blue mathematical conceptual structure that that makes no intuitive sense. I mean, it really has um structure which is kind of deeply rooted in understanding representation and understanding certain fundamental symmetries. Have you heard of this theorem by Rad and Moyes in differential geometry about the amount of differentiable structures that can be placed on different dimensions? So for dimension one, there's only, I think up to some up to diffeomorphism or up to differentiable yeah. structure. I forget the exact term. There's just one and then there's just two for dimension two or just one. There's a finite amount for every dimension two, yeah. except dimension four. Yeah. In which case, yeah. there's not just an infinite amount. There's an uncountably infinite amount. Yeah. But there's even, yeah. And, but this is actually, yeah, one, well, also one of the most famous open problems in, um, in topology, the smooth Poincare conjecture, which says that, um, you know, is there, there, there you're thinking about a specific, the, 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 the four manifold. Yeah. So is there a, um, now, now I forgot what I used to know about this, but yeah, but there are exotic. Well, the point is that dimension four is picked out, and so it would have been yeah. nice for physics if dimension four was picked out and finite, whereas the rest were infinite, because then it just means, well, it's nicer for us, but it's picked out and made more diverse and more mysterious. Yeah, but but it's how does this go? Um. And, and yes, yeah, so, 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 anyway, four, four dimensions is, <clears throat> anyway, t topologically, four, four dimensions is very, very special. That, um, yes. you know, one dimensions and two dimensions, you can kind of pretty easily understand the story is pretty story, but the, the classification story is pretty simple. Um, three dimensions is harder, but especially with a, with the solution of the Poincare conjecture, you could, you actually have a good three dimensional classification. And then, and then once you get above five, four dimensions, things, Basically, there are more ways to move things, so so things simplify, so you can actually you can actually understand above four dimensions what's going on. So four dimensions is kind of a, a peculiarly it's really complex, magically complex case, yeah. And so it's yeah, it's uh, but it, there is anyway, it, it, it's very. I, I've never actually seen though any kind of clear expl clear idea about how what this has to do with four dimensional with with, with physics. It, um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, the the thing, the stuff that I've been doing, you know, very much crucially involves the fact that four dimensions is special because the um, the way spinners work, or if you like, the the the, uh, the rotation group in in four in, in every dimensions is a simple group, except in four dimensions. <clears throat> in four dimensions, the rotation group breaks up into two independent pieces, and that's at the core of what a lot of what I'm trying to exploit. But um. So four-dimensional geometry is very, very special, and I don't know, speculative, very speculative. Maybe, maybe the this weirdness about you know infinite numbers of topological structures under four dimensions. That the fact that you've got the rotation group has two different pieces means that is behind that. But I have no, I have, I have no, I know, no, who of knows? Of course, of course. Who knows? Yeah, it's interesting that the fact that it's semi-simple is a positive here. Like you mentioned, it breaks up into two. Yeah. Whereas usually in physics for the grand unified theories, what you want is simple. You don't want semi-simple. You want to unify into one large group. Yeah. Well, you mean, you know, th there's nothing really in terms of unification. It's just, yeah. And maybe maybe it's an maybe I should also say something about this about why what what I'm trying to do I think is quite different than um, the usual sort of unification that the and and what the usual yeah. Yeah, and please explain Euclidean twister theory once more, again, for okay. people who are still like, I've heard the term, I've heard him explain twisters, I somewhat understand twisters, it has to do with lines and points and planes, okay, and spinners, something called spinners, I think I understand that. What is Euclidean twister theory? Minkowski's <laughs> like special relativity, okay, so they're still confused. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it's better to talk about what other, what standard kind of unification ideas are sure. and, and, and i think and, and to my mind i mean basically almost essentially all attempts to do unification founder in the same the same problem what they so 
it's one way of stating the problem is we go out and look at the world and you know we see gravity and we see um we see the electromagnetic interactions and and that's kind of based upon a u1 gauge theory which is a circle we see the weak interactions are based upon an su2 gauge theory that's a a three sphere and we see the strong interactions that are based upon an su3 gauge theory so <clears throat> where in the world did this u1 did these three groups come from and the way quarks and other elementary particles behave under those those groups there's a so it's a, it's a very small amount of geo, of group theoretical data where did it come from i mean why that and um so so the, so the the standard answer to this very soon after the standard model came about was that well there's some big league group like you you take like su5 so take the group of all unitary transformations of five complex dimensions or take the group of all orthogonal transformations of 10 dimensions let's say so 10 and then and that then you fit the da that data and show that that data fits inside that bigger structure okay that you can within that so 10 group we, I, I can fit a U1 and SU2 and, and a SU3. I can get them in there. And then I, and I can put all of the known particles together with their transformation properties and, and give them and make them have it and, and put those together as a transformation property of SO10. So you can kind of put stuff, <clears throat> this, this kind of package of, of algebraic data. We're trying to understand where it came from. You can put it together in a, in, in, in a simple group and in, in, into a, a group where the, pro the problem is <clears throat> in terms of group theory, it's a package involving it's several different groups. And so you get several different simple groups. So you can, you can, anyway, you can put this together, but, <clears throat> but, but the problem with, with, with this is with always is if you try and do this, mm -hmm. you can then write down your SU5 or SO10 theory, or whatever. And, and it, you know, it looks a lot nicer than the, the standard model it's only got one one term where you had a lot of terms before but you have to then explain but wait a minute why don't we see that why do we you know why do we see this this more complicated thing and not that and so for instance the standard thing that gray unified theories do is they you've put <clears throat> the weak the weak interactions and the strong interactions into the same structure so you you should have um anyway so, so so all sorts of things there are all sorts of new kind of forces that you're going to get in this bigger structure which are highly constrained which have to exist um which are going to do things like cause protons to decay so like you know why you, you sure sure yeah so it, you put the stuff together all of a sudden it, 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 it can interact with itself and and it can do things which you know don't happen and protons don't decay so 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 your problem when you write down these theories, the problem is that you you haven't necessarily done anything. You've you've put the stuff together in something bigger, but you haven't you've just changed the problem from why you know why why these pieces to to why did this bigger thing break into the how how do right. I how do I why did this bigger thing break into these pieces? It, you haven't actually solved until you have an explanation for that, you haven't actually solved anything. And this is, I think, the fundamental problem with these grand unified theories. They don't have they, they don't come with a really the only way to to, to make them break down and, into these other things is to introduce more higgs particles and more complicated structure and more degrees of and more numbers okay. and and you you lose predictivity if you do that you also find that yeah you know, they also don't look like what you see in the real world if you do experiments but most people who have tried to come up with some unification have done some version of that actually i mean so for instance, I mean, I don't want to really get into uh like things like what Garrett Lisi is talking about or um but 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 they're all they're all versions of this. You know, they they they've all got their own ver their version of this. And I think when you see people kind of dismissing theories of everything and green and theories, and you see um Sabina Hassenfelder saying, Well, you know, these people are lost in math, then they're 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 all really referring to the same problem that people are trying to get a better understanding was a, a deeper understanding of what's going on by putting things together into a bigger structure and then and they're and they're all kind of foundering on not having a an answer as to why why this breaks up so um so the, the thing that i'm trying to do with why i'm much more uh 
interested in these these ideas about about spinners and twisters is that I'm I'm not actually. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of what I'm doing, as I said, I mean the fact that the fact that there are these two SU2s, that's an that's an aspect of four dimensions. There really are. I, I, maybe the thing to say is that I'm not I'm not introducing kind of new. I'm not introducing lots of new degrees of freedom and then having to explain why you can't see them. I'm trying to write down something. I'm trying to write down a new geometrical package which packages mm-hmm. together the um the things we know about and doesn't and doesn't actually have new right. you know doesn't actually have all, all sorts of new stuff. Penrose said this was his motivation as well for twister yeah. theory. Yeah. Yeah, so twister theory you know and so in some sense twister theory is a bigger structure but it's not um it doesn't kind of contain anything really new. It, it, it contains the same spinners you had before and puts them in an interesting new relation where so you can understand conformal invariants. But he doesn't, um, it's like, you know, twister theory is not the things you knew about twister theory. It's not spinners and vectors and the things you knew about plus some other completely unrelated stuff. It's the things you knew about in a new, more powerful conceptual framework. And so that that's the, the sort of thing I'm trying I'm trying to do. Um, the, the, part of the problem is that you know it, it it's a I guess a misnomer to really say, to say this is a well-defined theory. It's more a, a speculative set of ideas about how to. Uh, but but, yes. but 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 that's the crucial. I mean, per, probably I think the most important new idea here, which the which, which for this to be right has to be true, and which is I mean, is exactly this idea that, about. Um, about rota- that if you think about rotations in four dimensions in Euclidean space time, when you relate it to Minkowski space time in the real world, one of the SU2s can be treated as an internal symmetry. And that and that could explain the weak interactions. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of a crucial uh, yeah. That's why it's also referred to as gravel weak unification by you or by other people. Uh, well other people have have, you know, I mean other people have noticed this and and actually it's interesting when you read the um a lot of the, some of the you know literature on twister theory, people point this out. They say exactly the problem I was pointing out that this is a very chiral, chirally asymmetric view of the world. And a lot of people said, "Oh, well, that means you know maybe you should you should be able to understand you know the weak interactions are chirally asymmetric. So maybe there's something here." But the twister people, I think, never really had a version of this. The um, I mean, there are various people who have tried to write down to do this. I mean, one is actually um, there is a paper by uh. I know Stefan Alexander has worked on this and Lee Smolin. They actually had a, a paper attempt to do this, but they, um, I mean, what they're doing is significantly different than what I'm trying to do. In particular, they're, um, they're staying in Minkowski space. I mean, this idea of going to, to, to Euclidean space to get the, um, anyway, yeah, to, to, to get, to, to get this thing to behave like, like an internal symmetry is not something that, um, that, that it is is in their work. I know. Mm-hmm. You know Jonathan Oppenheim. A, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I know, yeah. Jonathan Oppenheim, Stefan Alexander, and Nima Arkani Hamed all were graduate school peers at the same time as my brother in physics. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is interesting because then later this, on this in my this life, was, this was all in in Canada, right? Yeah, yeah. So U of T, Nima was at U of T, University of Toronto, with my brother. But then yeah. in graduate school, Oppenheim and Stefan Alexander. I spoke to Stefan on the podcast as well. Yeah, no. So he, he, he uh, there, there have been very few physicists who've been encouraging about this. I mean, so he he he's one example. So yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's extremely open to new ideas. Yeah. And playful. He's a playful yeah. person with ideas. Yeah. yeah. Much like with his music. I think that both qualities rub off on one another. Yeah. And I and I think also in his own research, he's also I think he hasn't it's not so much that he's followed up on this Grab a Week stuff, but he's he is very interested in you know, it, 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 is there some way in which gravity, you know, that gravity actually is a chiral theory? There is some chiral asymmetry in gravity, and and especially, you know, can you, you know, anyway, anyway, I mean, are there kind of astrophysical and cosmological thing places you can go and look and see? You know, is gravity really um, mm-hmm. chiral asymmetric or not? And so I know that that's something that he's worked a lot on. So he's working on experimental tests of the chirality of gravity, but that doesn't mean yeah. experimental tests of your theory just no, your theory yeah. is a chiral theory of gravity yeah it's a 
it's a chiral theory, but but it's not. Um, it would be validation of your theory or attestation. No, I mean, I, I, it's kind of. I mean, first of all, I, again, I have to keep saying I don't really have it. I don't. I would love to say I. I, I would love to say I, I've written down a consistent proposal for a theory of quantum gravity based on my ideas, but I, I'm not. I'm not there yet, and and the um. I think what he's doing is more. It doesn't involve. Doesn't have. The structures I'm trying to exploit are not there in what he's doing, but I, I, I believe what he's doing is more kind of thing you, you kind of add Chern Simons kind of terms. It's, you assume that maybe there's some Chern Simons term in the theory, and 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 ask, you know, what the, what the observational uh, implications of that would be, and, and and try and go out and look for that. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I I haven't looked. I haven't really carefully look, looked at what he's doing because it just because it's it's quite different than what I'm trying to do. Can you explain what Chern Simons theory is? So what it means to add a Chern Simons term? I know Stefan's worked on Chern Simon modified gravity. And then there's something like Chern Simon terms in the Lagrangian of particle physics, but I don't know if those two are related. Yeah, I I don't yeah, I shouldn't try to talk about it as work I don't I don't remember exactly what he was it was doing. But um well Chern Simon they're very hard. Actually one one funny thing is that I actually went to a, uh, I don't know. Uh, so I actually started thinking about churn. So so maybe maybe I can go back to um, how I, how I first encountered them. So when I was doing my PhD thesis, my problem was I'm trying to understand. I got engaged sitting on a computer, and, and I've got this anyway this this version of of gauge fields, and they're described on link on links on a lattice and and and, and a computer, and and you can store them in a computer and manipulate them. And I want to look at one of these configurations and say, you know, there's supposed to be some, there's some interesting topology in this engaged theory. And this is what people are getting interested in the seventies and eighties. And so in particular, there's something called the, let's say the, the instanton number. And so, you know, these gauge fields are supposed to have some integer invariant called the instanton number. And if somebody hands you a gauge field on a compact manifold, you should be able to calculate its, um, it's instanton number, and you can then then you could, if you could st- if you could measure these if you could calculate these instanton numbers and see them, you could do interesting physics with it. Mm-hmm. So so the problem in some sense problem my thesis was, you've got these these gauge fields. What are their instanton numbers? Can you define them? And so, and they're just integers. They're just integers. Yeah. So so they're 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 invariants, but they're not invariants of the base manifold. You have a you basically have a, a bundle with connection, and, and they're invariants of the bundle. And if you know the connection, you can you're you're, you're sensitive to this invariant. Um, but the, the 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 one way of looking at that though is if you look at the integral formula for this thing, it's a it's a total derivative. So that if you try and inter, if you're trying to integrate it over a ball or if you, or or a hypercube, the formula that's supposed to add up to this instanton number it. <clears throat> It, you can write it as a as an integral over the boundary, right? It's, it, it's the integral of d of something, so it's it's the it's the integral it's the integral of boundary. It's a, it's a total derivative, so you can sure. you can see. So the um, so so the thing that, the thing that it's a total derivative. The thing that that lives on the boundary is the is the Chern Simons form actually. Okay, so that's. This is kind of the first way that people started seeing this thing in um, in physics. Is that and so 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 one idea was like, well, I could um, yeah. if I could cal- instead of calculating these instanton numbers, if I try and do it in terms of their local contributions from each hypercube, I should if I could just calculate the Chern Simons not the churn simons number the contribution for, you know the t- if i could cut ca- ca- the uh-huh, uh-huh. that thing th- th- then 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 i would be done and so i spent a lot of time looking at the churn simons formula and and then i spent a lot of time trying to put that in the lattice and then i, I kind of finally realized it's kind of gauge the the, the, the problem the problem is that it's very gauge invariant so a- any kind of idea you have about how to um how to calculate it or construct it tends to be just an artifact of, of 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 some choices you're making because of uh, because of gauge symmetry. So th- th- this though that led to one of the great experiences of my life. I was at when I was at a MSRI. Um, 
you know, Atiyah was visiting, and at one point, Atiyah and a bunch of people were talking to the blackboard, and somebody was asking Atiyah, said, "Oh, you know, how 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 would you like in you know how would you calculate this Chern Simons number? Because then Chern Simons had become incredibly important because of Witten, and and um and so so everybody was like Witten had said." You can you can get these wonderful knot invariants and three manifold invariants if you can do path integrals and and that you should take the path integral to be e to the i times the Chern Simons number exactly that integral that I was talking about but, yes but 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 Witten now wants to integrate it over a whole three manifold and so people were asking at at here well you know what can can we try and think about how can we actually do this calculation what we do and and so, and then, then Atia for thinking for about for about five seconds comes up and says, "Oh well, maybe you know you could calculate it this. You could calculate it this way. Do this." And mm-hmm. I was standing. I was luckily standing there. And since Atia had thought about it for about ten seconds, I thought about it for about three years. <laughs> <laughs> I could say, "No, no, no, that doesn't work. You can't do that because of this." And so, oh, was, great, great, great. So, so that was one of uh, the high points of my mathematical career. Yeah. But anyway. But I, I don't know that this is in any way answered any question. But that's that's one definition of it. But it, it, it's a very um, it, it, it's it's kind of an an amazing um piece of information about you know about about gauge fields about connections and um it tells you some very subtle things and it turns out to to be useful for all describe all sorts of interesting and unexpected physical phenomena. And these speculative ideas of yours of gravel weak unification, have they been sent to Penrose? Has Penrose commented on them? Um, I I haven't heard anything back from Penrose. The, the Pe- Penrose is a little bit of a problem that I don't actually. Anyway, wh- wh- whatever email I had from him back when he was helping my book no longer works, and other emails tend to bounce and say you don't have mutual friends. Um, I I I I I, I, I could make more of it. I, I I haven't made more of it. I also keep also hoping. Uh, I've, I've I've come this close to actually run, running into him and being at the same conference as something with him and being and having a chance to talk to him personally. And I keep expecting, you know, instead of making a further effort to get to get a manuscript to him, part of the problem you'll see if you try and if you don't know his email and you try and contact him, you you end up getting a secretary and who may or may not be yeah. forwarding things to him. And right, so, right. So I don't know, but I, I keep hoping. Yeah, I was actually at Oxford last year and. Um, Actually, was there somebody who was showing me? Oh, that's Penrose's office. And then I went to do something else. And then the next, the next day, they said, "Oh, you know, 15 minutes after we were there, Penrose showed up." And oh boy! So anyway, the so, lowest so, points so, of your mathematical career. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how this would work. I, you know, my my from things that he said about this kind of thing, I think he's made it very clear that he 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 has always explicitly he's been. You know, he's followed the kind of thing Atia did, the, the kind of Euclidean version of the theory. But he's always said very clearly that in his mind, the Euclidean version of theory is not the theory. What's the theory is what's happening mm-hmm. in the Minkowski space. And that's and so he's a, a, anyway, whether whether I could convince him otherwise, I don't know. But I think he's kind of cl- pretty clearly in his mind thought through, okay, there is this interesting Euclidean theory, but that's actually not really the physical thing is Minkowski, so I don't actually believe you're going to, that by working over there, you're going to actually tell me something important. But, um, mm-hmm. but so I, I would, I think I'd have to get around that particular, uh, initial reaction from him. So forgive this fairly foolish question, but if both GR and the standard model can be formulated in terms of bundles, then why can't you just take a direct product of the groups? So for instance, you have the standard model gauge groups. And then you direct product with SO13. So that's the principle. And you make an associated frame bundle. That's like just the projection yeah. of SO13. And then you say that's general relativity. And the other ones, the other associated bundles, the standard model. And then you call that unification. Like, is that unification? What are the problems there? Well, no, I mean, the problem is that um, so gen- general relativity is a, is, is a different. Well, maybe the thing to say is, so gauge theory is, Really, just what you have is a bu- is, is is a bundle, and the fibers are some group, and and you ha- you have connections and curvature on that. You write down a, the the interesting Lagrangian is the norm squared of the curvature, and anyway, so so gauge theory is, is a nice pretty story. Um, if you try and write general relativity in the same language, you you know you can do it. it, it 
it's fine. You 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 have a G bundle where G is SO three one or the Euclidean root, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you have a connection. You have a curvature. But the the problem the problem is that you you crucially the problem is that you 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 crucially have something you have other something else and you have other things specifically because you're not some arbitrary G bundle. You're the frame bundle, and the the, the frame bundle you know it has. You know, it, it, it's a principal bundle for you know the the group of just all changes of frame, but mm-hmm. it, it, it it also is. I mean, people use the term soldered or tie. It's also it also knows about the base structure. So, right, a, a point in the fiber of the frame bundle is not just a, an abstract group element. <laughs> it's a frame. It, 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 it's a frame down down on the, down on. It, you know, if, yes, if you yes, take yes. vectors, you can project on the base space, and it's a frame for those vectors. So, so it's kind of soldered to the tangent space, and it. it so it, it, it. What what this means in practice is it means that there's, there there's there's new, there's new variables which which are in the um, which you have which which are part of the story, which are not just the, not just the. So three one connection and curvature. There's also you know so in, you you've got this connection one form and curve soldering form. Yeah, it's called the soldering form or the tetrad, or I mean there are a lot of different 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 people have names for it. But there's kind of there's kind of a one form. You feed it the vector, and and you, you feed it a vector, and it tells you. And you know since you're up in the frame bundle, you've got a frame, and this one form has. You know, it has components which tell you what what the components of the vector are with respect to the frame. Mm-hmm. So it's a very kind of canonical object, but it, you know, it, it's there. It it, it the space time geometry depends upon it. So so the space time geometry doesn't just depend upon the the connection, the curvature. It depends upon the connection, the curve, the connection, and this 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 um this canonical one form. So the problem is that. So, so it, you, you've got extra variables which you didn't have in the; these just don't exist in the Yang Mills case. And you have to, and so you can, and and with those variables, you can you can write down a different a different lower order Lagrangian. Instead of taking the taking the curvature squared, you can take the curvature times some of these guys, and you can get the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian. So, so, so you. you the fundamental Lagrangian of gravity is very different than the fundamental Lagrangian of Yang Mills theory, and it, it's because you've got these extra gadgets to work with. The I see, I see the canonical one form. So that's the that's one way of saying it. You can, but uh, you know, people have, have speculated a lot about why, you know, why not w- w- why not just try like adding these higher curvature terms like you had in the in the uh, Yang Mills case, add those to gravity. And anyway, there's a long, long story about trying to mess with different change the Lagrangian of gravity to try to something better behave. Now, have you found any unification attempts that are between gravity and the standard model or gravity in any of the interactions that are improved if you don't view gravity as curvature, but rather as torsion? So for instance, this is something Einstein was working on later in his life. And then there's also non-metricity. Carton was working on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and so, they're so, equivalent so... formulations of gravity. At least the torsion one. The yeah. gravity is actually not curvature; it's just torsion. Yeah, yeah. So the um, well, w- w- one way to say it is: so, so now, what, once you've got these, so the, the thing about, but the, if you write, start writing down a theory of gravity. Well, first of all, I mean, non-metricity. I think some of that may just mean. Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly what people mean by that. I, I shouldn't say. So the two compatibility conditions to create the. Levi Chavita connection, I believe it's called. Yeah. Is that you have no torsion and that you have that the metric doesn't change with the covariant derivative. So if you take the covariant yeah. derivative on the metric, it's zero. If you don't have that, then you have non metricity. In other words, along the parallel transport, the metric is preserved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. But but I, I can't say about, about torsion that the um but your 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 problem is that if you um so it if you just write down a theory with with, uh, with some Lagr- you put together a Lagrangian which is which is going to be give you equivalent results to the um, Einstein Hilbert you put it together out of the curvature and the canonical one form now your problem is that you've got 
you know, when you try to get the euler Lagrange equations, you you can you can vary you can vary the canonical one form and you can vary the the connection. So you've got and 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 one of them, let's say I guess it's if you vary the connection, then 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 you end up that that gives you the torsion free condition. So 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 you you you've got more variables, so you need more equations. So you you recover gravity, but you recover um with the standard Lagrangian, you recover not the Einstein's equations and as one equation, but 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 also the the torsion free condition as, as the other one. So uh -huh. I mean, so 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 there's the standard simplest you know version of Einstein Hilbert in that theory you know, ha has no torsion again. But you can um you can certainly write down more 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 different Lagrangians in, in which torsion is you know is not zero, but is some kind of has some kind of dynamics and does something. And, and that might be interesting. I mean, yeah, I was watching a talk a few, maybe a few weeks ago or a couple months ago, about when trying to modify gravity, especially for explaining "quote unquote" dark matter. That you can explain dark matter as a particle, but if you want to do modified gravity, it's useful to have torsion in your theory. Well, anyway, what I was thinking was, okay, if it's useful there, maybe it's not actually the case that that explains dark matter, but maybe. It would be more useful to try unification with torsion models of gravity than with the regular curvature yeah. model of gravity. Yeah, I, I don't. I, mean, I, I should say uh, one kind of funny thing about all this is that I've always, I mean, before I got involved in in this particular thing, I, I tended to kind of stick to to thinking. Uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time over the years trying to learn about quantum gravity and about these issues that we're talking about, but I never actually. You know, got really serious about them and to and, and, and developed any real expertise with them because um I always kind of felt that they're I don't know I, I I'm trying to understand what's going on in part in particle physics and, and the standard model and there's mm -hmm. there are these groups of people who you know just think who just think about quantum gravity and that you know they're very smart they've been doing this for thirty or forty years and even and a lot of them aren't string theorists and um and you know I don't. I'm not seeing anything that they're doing that I that or that I could have any kind of you know that I could do it anyway better like you know that they seem to be doing interesting things with torsion but they know more about torsion than I do do so right right yeah so I I I kind of you know anyway I kind of stayed away from you come from, from a more particle yeah yeah exactly yeah that's the way of saying it but I, I really stayed away from kind of be, going more in that direction becoming more expert a lot of these things figuring yeah I mean. I, I, until I see something that I can, that I maybe I can do something with. I mean, if it's just a, it's interesting to see what the story is there. But they're they're really smart people who've been banging away at the story for a long time, and I can't help I, I'll stay away from it. But um, so yeah, so so I I kind of had to I I've actually partly because of this had to had to learn a lot more about get some remedial education on some of this stuff, and uh, <laughs> so I, I'm I'm but I'm, I'm still in some sense the wrong person to talk to about theories of gravity and about the. Uh, yeah. Before we wrap up, there are a couple other proposed toes. So one with Lisi, like you mentioned, and then yeah. Eric Weinstein has geometric unity and Wolfram has Wolfram's physics project. I believe that's still the title. And Chiara Marletto has a framework, not an actual toe, but constructor theory. Yeah. So which of those have you delved even superficially into? And what are your comments on them? I'm, I should say, I mean, the, um, Wolfram or, or the other one mentioned. Yeah. So, so the, these ideas that you're going to start with some completely different starting point, like Wolfram, we're going to start, I don't know, whatever you want to call whatever he's starting with. The fact that you're going to start from this kind of completely different thing that has nothing to do with any of the mathematics we, that we know of and, and that you're going to then reproduce the standard model, whatever this, that seems to be highly implausible. And, and anything I've ever looked at it and of his for, for briefly, you know, doesn't change that opinion. I just, I just don't see how you get from. Anyway, I you mean, you're telling me that you're you're going to go so start and start way, way, way far away at something else, and 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 make some progress right here. And, and I don't see how you're going to get, you're ever going to get back. And uh -huh. so, yeah, so so I, there's a lot of that. Um, uh, Lizzie's thing, I looked a bit at a bit. And so so I I know G Garrett and. Eric both fairly well, you know. So Garrett has slept on my couch like many people, <laughs> but but uh, 
and 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 you know, so, so Garrett, I think you know, had a fairly well defined proposal, but but to my mind, it has exactly the same the problems that um I was telling you about. You know, he 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 wants to put. So these are the same problems you explicated about grand unified theories earlier. Yeah. So he wants to to to, to put out, put all these things together, and he wants to put it together and have it live inside E8, and it's very nice, except that he doesn't really have a. To my mind, by doing that, he hasn't actually solved the problem. He has to tell me why, how the E8 break, why the E8 breaks down into the pieces that we we know about, and and you know, he doesn't have any, as far as I know, has no useful um, idea about that. But but he he is a fairly well defined thing. I mean, Eric, you know, I've talked to it a lot about this over the years. I've, um, I, I don't know. I mean, he and 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 I've looked a bit at, at you know paper that he finally put out, but. I, I think again. It, it seems to me it, it, it has the same kind of problems. Again, he, he's trying to put he's trying to put everything together into this bigger geometric structure, and then but but he he doesn't, to my mind, have have any kind of plausible idea about how he's ever going to break that down and recover what 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 we uh, the real world that we see. So, and 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 his 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 is a lot you know, harder to see exactly what he's doing, or, or, or unless Lizzie is kind of following much more kind of standard story you can you can see exactly what he's doing where um, it's harder to tell but but both of them i i, I think suffer from the same problem as, as guts as far as i know mm-hmm. what about category theory there's plenty of hype about category theory in physics but you're also in math and so you're much more close to category theory is there a hope that somehow higher categorical structures will elucidate how to make progress in high energy physics yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any evidence for that. I mean, the the things people are doing with those are actually much more um, trying to like understand. There's a lot of act, people actively trying to use some of that mathematics to understand like um, classification of more kind of more the kind of theories you would use in condensed matter systems. So, um, hmm. um, it, 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 it's it's possible that uh, you know the right way to to understand, you know, ga- gauge groups, you know, the, the infinite dimensional group of all gauge transformations, or or even, or maybe you can even think of the diffeomorphism group about how to think about representations of those groups, those groups, and maybe that the higher categorical stuff has something useful to say about that, that because there the problem is that you, the standard notions of what a representation is don't really... The, the problem is when you're dealing with these inferential groups, you really don't even know what you, you can't just say representation. You have to put some more additional structure to make this well defined mm. and, and what the additional structure is unclear and maybe it would help with those. But, but anyway, I, I haven't really followed I've spent some effort trying to follow that mathematics, but I don't, uh, don't do that. And, 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 ca- and uh, anyway, ca- category theory in general is just a very, very general idea. You know, I mean, the problem is it's a very very general idea so it's, it's something it's part of you know the way mathematicians think about every subject you know that i really it's very very useful to think not about representations but the category of all representations to think of that and that opens up all sorts of new quite new ways of thinking and questions to that but it's um but it, it it's just a very very abstract language so it it can be used for many, many things. And, and I think what I realized at some point when I was a student, I was very, I thought, okay, well, you know, the way to understand mathematics is to find, you know, look at these, these, the mathematics are teaching us and look for the more and more general structures and then just find them, understand the most general structure. And then, you know, you'll be able to, 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 to derive the rest of the stuff. And so, and then it looked like category theory was, was this thing, which was the most general thing that people were using. And so I thought I should go learn category theory. But then at some point I realized that what I was do- what you're doing is that as you go to greater and greater generality, mm-hmm. you're 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 saying what what you're doing, you're talking about you're saying something about more things, but you're saying less and less. And so in the limit, you're saying nothing about everything, which mm-hmm. is really not not actually a useful limit. And and that's the problem with just you know, category theory as just a in its most general meaning, it's it, it, it's very useful. It can do all sorts of things, but it's not. Um, anyway, it's telling you a, a bit about everything, but 
yeah, it, it, it's too it's too much generality to, to to really kind of. Now, what if someone retorts about the polemics against string theory by saying, "Hey, look, string theory has produced something much that's positive." So, for instance, the math is used in condensed. Sorry, is used in the fractional quantum Hall effect. And many other that's condensed a, matter no, systems. That's a, that, 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 no, <laughs> that's yeah. No, the, the, the string theory hasn't. That, that stuff doesn't. Well, for, first of all, I mean, a lot of the time when people are talking about this, they're they're talking about something which didn't actually come from string theory. It's quantum field theory. So yeah, like the fractional quantum Hall effect. I mean, I don't think that, that, there's not any string theory. There. there was a comment that said, "Look, I'm a physicist and I'm not a string theorist, but we use string theory in the fractional quantum Hall effect." And that was a comment on the Ed Frankel video. Well, I, I think probably. I mean, the, the, the problem is, is string theorists are are happy to kind of claim, yeah. Any, anyway, I mean, they're kind of claiming that everything comes from a string theory, and and they're they're actually at this point, David Gross kind of argues that well, you can't argue, you you have to shut up and stop arguing about string theory because string theory and quantum field theory are actually all one big thing, and so you're arguing against quantum field theory, so. That's just a waste of yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. so because string theory is supposed to be a generalization of quantum field theory. Well, it's because oh, you know, with these dualities and M theory, whenever we we realize it's all the same, and so it, anyway, so so I, I, I don't know in this in this specific case, and I'm not an expert on, on that case, but I, I strongly suspect that the um, saying that this came from string theory is that it's really some fact that they learned from string theorists, and string theorists are happy to can't say this came from string theory, but it, but it, it's not actually. And, and to, to make this whole thing even more frustrating, more complicated, is that no one actually can, at this point, has a definition of what string theory is. So you can, people then start talking about kind of like what Gross is trying to do. He's, tr he's trying to say, well, string theory and quantum field theory are all the same. So when I say string theory, I mean quantum field theory. And and, and people just keep doing this and, mm. you know, so you, anyway. And so it, unless you're really, really expert and you know exactly what, the story is about what string theory is and how it's related to quantum field theories, whatever you, 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 you easily get very, very confused. Another, another weird thing I found is that almost everyone believes that Ed Witten wrote, um, one, uh, Fields Medal for his work on string theory, which is just not true. It's just right, not true. Right, right. I mean, the things that he won the Fields Medal for is these totally amazing things in mathematics are actually quantum field theory things are not they actually have yeah basically nothing to do with string theory but and the positive energy theorem yeah and 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 those things i mean they're they, they're not string theory but but right. you know it, it's it's really hard to convince anyone of this even even most mathematicians believe this if you go up and ask a mathematician you know did did witten the string theory part of what witten when the hills smell part of them i'm sure they'll all most of them will say oh probably is yeah sounds right so what's a fulfilling life for you, Peter? Well, I'm really, I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy. I mean, one, I think, you know, when my book came out, a lot of people, you know, kind of the ad hominem attack was, oh, here's this, this, this guy who was not a, not a success and didn't really, and he's just embittered and unhappy. And they, they, they don't, didn't realize that I'm, I'm actually quite, quite, disgustingly pleased with my life and very happy with mm -hmm. myself and and things mm -hmm. have gone i mean i've had a weird career here at columbia and it's a it's a very but i've been extremely well treated by the department and uh uh allowed pretty much to do to get away as i said get away with doing whatever i want and treated well and paid well and uh had a very 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 happy life and so i'm meaningful yeah, and I'm 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 actually you know proud of the books I've written, and some of the things I've done, and I'm I'm actually quite excited about what what I'm working on now. I mean, and uh, this was always one of my great frustrations is that you know, I could there were a lot of things that seemed to be inter that inter something interesting was going on, but I didn't understand enough to to really be sure this is really something. You know, I've really got something here, and uh, now I now I'm much more optimistic about that, and so I'm trying to I'm I'm getting getting older though I'm 66. I'm trying to figure out. I'm a, I'm actually trying to negotiate with the department, of the university, some kind of exit strategy out of my from my current position to some some different kind of situation here, and I may where I might be doing le less teaching and less to and 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 less involved and less taking care of the computers, get other people to do that. So we'll, we'll you take see. care of the computers? 
I, well, I, I, I told you about this. So, so part of my my I'm well, my official title is senior lecturer, and uh-huh. uh, the weird thing about this title is, is this is a, a a title that the university gives to people who are they're non tenured positions, but are but are teaching teaching courses here, and so I'm doing that. But I've also part of the deal with the department has always been that I do relatively not that much teaching, but also make sure the department computer system runs, and so I actually do. I, on a day-to-day basis, I also make sure our computer system's going. So I do. You don't want to do that anymore. Well, I'm, let's just say I like to, like like to do. Uh, maybe a better way of saying it is is I mean uh, I've actually actually kind of kind of enjoy that actually. There's actually that's always been never that's always been been in some ways fun. But um, there there is an inconsistency I found between you know having the time and focus to work on making progress on the stuff I want to make progress on and also teaching a course and also having to deal off and on with computer problems and trying to fit all those together in a 40 hour week is not really doesn't work so well. So one of the, and, 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 and I've decided in my life, is I definitely have to prioritize the, the working on these new ideas. So I've got to start dumping some of the other things and change things, but um, we'll see. I managed to find that specific comment that was referenced earlier, and I sent it to Peter Woit over email. Here's the comment, and then subsequently there'll be Peter's response. I am a physicist, and I use string theory all the time in my research on the fractional quantum Hall effect. What Frankel means here is that the expectation to find the standard model in the 90s by Calabi-Yau compactification of one of the superstring theories turned out to be unfulfillable to this date. This does not harm the theory. The prediction was just wrong, therefore the title of this video is misleading. String theory revolutionized the way we understand physics and math in general, and it continues to do so. By the way, it's the only consistent theory unifying quantum field theory and gravity. Peter's response is, Hi Kurt, in the podcast I misunderstood what you were telling me, that a condensed matter theorist was saying that that they thought understanding the fractional quantum Hall effect used string theory. I was speculating that they were misunderstanding some QFT explanation as a string theory explanation. It seems, though, that this is not a condensed matter theorist, but a string theorist. The quote-unquote string theory revolutionized the way we understand physics and math in general and continues to do so is just pure hype. It's the sort of thing you will ever hear from a string theorist devoted to that cause. I was unaware that some string theorists have worked on embedding the fractional quantum Hall effect system in a complicated string theory setup. I don't understand the details of this from long experience, think it's highly likely. This, like many string theory explains condensed matter physics claims, is just hype. String theory since the beginning has had a huge problem and it continues to this day. The current tactic for dealing with the failure of string theory hype around particle physics is to double down with new hype about nuclear physics, condensed matter physics, and quantum information theory, etc., etc. Peter then quickly sent a follow-up email. Hey, I just read the thread. I'm guessing this is a string theory undergrad or graduate student. The claims about the fractional quantum Hall effect are based on relating it to Chern-Simons theory, which is a QFT story, so a quantum field theoretic story. Also, all those fans of David Hestein should know that I did ask Peter about geometric algebra, but he's not familiar enough to comment on it. Okay, well... It was wonderful speaking with you, and I hope we speak again. I hope we meet in person. Oh, sure. Let me know if you're ever in New York. Oh, yeah. I go quite frequently, so I'll let you know the next time I'm there, and maybe I'll see you at Perimeter if you ever come down this way. Yeah, I haven't haven't been there yet, but I would, would at some point like to, like to like to go there. I've, uh, I just signed up to participate via Zoom. They have a conference on like quantum gravity at the end of the month, mm-hmm. and uh, and, but it's mostly virtual, and so you can. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll watch some of the talks on Zoom, but but someday I'll actually get there physically. All right, sir. Take care. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for coming on. Bye now. Bye bye. The podcast is now concluded. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now would be a great time to do so, as each subscribe and like helps YouTube push this content to more people. You should also know that there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything, where people explicate toes, disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toes. Links to both are in the description. Also, I recently found out that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that when you share on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube that people are talking about this outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube as well. Last but not least, 
You should know that this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on every one of the audio platforms. Just type in Theories of Everything and you'll find it. Often I gain from re-watching lectures and podcasts, and I read that in the comments, hey, Toll listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead re-listening on those platforms? iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. If you'd like to support more conversations like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Kurt Jimungle and donating with whatever you like. Again, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You get early access to ad free audio episodes there as well. For instance, this episode was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough.